The narrative of our story originates in a region with mountain peaks and a red scarlet sky. Upon seeing its prey, the monster opened its mouth with a fierce desire to taste human flesh. But our protagonist did not experience a single drop of fear in front of such a terrible creature. On the contrary, he experienced an even more burning desire to destroy the monster. The huge monster pounced on our protagonist, but at the very last moment, he managed to stick a dagger in him. The monster stopped, and from his huge mouth, dotted with sharp fangs, flowed purple and sticky blood. Although our protagonist rushed at the monster with furious rage, it was obvious from his trembling hands that he was afraid. For just a few seconds ago, he could lose his life. Fortunately, the attack was successful. The monster dropped dead, rising up and looking at the body of the monster that had threatened his life a few moments ago. He breathed a sigh of relief. I was finally able to kill a monster with my own hands, he said, feeling proud of the accomplishment. However, at the same instant he experienced the feeling of pride, he was pulled away by someone's male voice. As it turned out, the man was on a real battlefield, and the monster he had recently killed was a mere pittance compared to the monsters that people were fighting nearby. The guy who called out to our protagonist was outraged that the unawakened man wasn't doing his job as a porter and picking up the loot from the corpses. The guy on the right was also indignant that the protagonist was not doing his job. Hearing their indignant voices, our protagonist immediately changed his expression and apologized for his incompetence. Damn, useless porters, the guy said indignantly, turning his back to our protagonist and heading for the battlefield. However, instead of continuing his work, our protagonist froze in place, immersed in his thoughts. This world wasn't so simple. Everything changed after the opening of the abyss. The abyss is another dimension, where the monsters that existed only in fantasies and in the worst nightmares actually lived. Along with the arrival of the abyss, another event occurred that changed the history of this world into before and after. In people awakened extraordinary powers, and with them humanity began to destroy monsters and conquer the abyss. Because of all this, people began to be judged not by personality or endeavor, but by awakening rank. If a person had a high rank, a good life was guaranteed. As is often the case, there are those who are lucky and those to whom luck has turned its back. One of such unlucky people was our protagonist. He is only a porter, collecting the belongings of the awakened, and has failed to awaken his powers at the age of 35. Considering how the entire world order had changed, such a worthless life awaited him if he didn't become awakened. Finished picking things up from the corpses of the monsters, he reported that he had finished the job, but what he saw made his body goosebumps. While collecting the corpses of the monsters, he had not paid attention to what was happening nearby, and now the ground was covered with the corpses of the awakened, who had mercilessly destroyed the monsters before. Among the corpses were also those two. They felt special against the background of the useless and worthless protagonist, but now, their lifeless bodies drenched in blood lay on the ground. In the first seconds after what he had seen, our protagonist, though he experienced fear in his body, did not fully realize what had happened. But after a while, when he realized what had actually happened, he could not believe his eyes. At the same instant that he realized what had happened, a huge monster appeared behind him. But it was no ordinary monster at all. It was a SSS rank monster named Asmodeus. Either losing his mind, or wanting to demonstrate that he is capable of more, our protagonist rushed at the huge monster with only one dagger. The monster did not hurry or show animal fury, which was inherent in most monsters. He only smoothly and not hurriedly swung his hand. This slight movement was enough to cut off the protagonist's arm in the blink of an eye. He fell to the ground, writhing in pain and bleeding. Meanwhile, the monster was in no hurry and stood motionless, watching the suffering of our protagonist. Despite the infernal pain that pulsed through his entire body, he managed to get up and look at the monster. The monster, meanwhile, lowered several arms, from which long clots of energy emerged. As soon as they touched the protagonist's face, several rivulets of scarlet blood flowed down it. The monster enjoyed watching him suffer, as our protagonist experienced unprecedented horror. His whole life flashed before his eyes. Memories of when his parents died in a car accident, memories of his school days, and being bullied. It wasn't just the monster and the memories that gave him agony. The realization that he was ignored for the rest of his life, because he was unawakened, was also weighing on his mind. And being on the brink of death, he asked himself only one question. Am I going to die a porter? Pathetic, worthless, and useless? Tears of despair mingled with the blood that slowly trickled down his cheeks. It seemed that everything had come to an end, 
and our protagonist would perish before he could realize his true potential. However, in the next second, an event occurred that was previously unimaginable. Being on the threshold of death and resigned to his fate, our protagonist fulfilled all the conditions of awakening. He found himself in a strange and mysterious place. Near him was the golden staircase, and at its summit stood a mysterious, luminous white figure. With a surprised and uncomprehending look, our protagonist looked at the one who was nearby. This mysterious figure resembled a man, but he had neither skin nor clothes. He turned around, remembering that only moments ago Asmodeus had tried to destroy him. The giant monster stood motionless. Time seemed to freeze around him. It was hard to believe that Asmodeus, the monster, who had previously effortlessly destroyed dozens, if not hundreds of awakened humans, had stopped for some reason unknown to our protagonist. You seem surprised that someone like Asmodeus stopped, don't you? said the mysterious stranger, coming down the stairs. The protagonist who turned around felt profoundly confused about what was happening, and he asked the stranger who he was. Who knows? Some call me king, some may be otherwise, but you don't worry about that, said the stranger to our protagonist. A golden chair appeared beneath the stranger, shining as brightly as himself. Seating himself on it and putting his hand under his chin, he told our protagonist that he should grant him power. King? Power? What is this stranger even talking about? Did he really stop Asmodeus? Everything was happening somehow fast, and our protagonist did not understand anything at all. More and more questions appeared in his mind, and there was no answer to them. As if reading his thoughts, the stranger said that there was no need to be so distrustful. I just recognized your will and perseverance, that's why I chose you, said the stranger. However, the stranger warned the protagonist that it would be better if he thought that such a miracle would never happen again. Still not understanding anything, he tried to find out from the stranger what the stranger meant. The stranger was in no hurry to share answers, and told the protagonist to just wait patiently for the moment. Sooner or later the day will come when you'll realize everything, and that's when we'll meet again, said the stranger. And those were his last words. The protagonist sat still, not understanding anything, while a huge monster with a mouth of sharp fangs, remotely resembling a dragon, descended on him from above. After that, he found himself as if in an endless darkness, dark and impenetrable. He heard someone's voice, soft and muffled. He began to open his eyes slowly and saw a bright light. But besides that, he also saw a man saying something to him. The protagonist regained consciousness after being slapped. When he woke up, he tried to understand what was going on. The guy who had slapped him a few seconds earlier was holding him by his school uniform, and it was clear from the look in his eyes that he intended to bully our protagonist even more. The face and voice of this creep was familiar to our protagonist. This guy's name was Bay Hacks. Instead of running away or trying to talk to him, the protagonist tried to figure out how this high school creep had gotten here, for he remembered exactly that he had just been in the abyss. And as the creep continued to beat him, he remembered the words of that mysterious stranger who had said something about power. And in that moment of reflection, something strange appeared before him, surprising him. It was a status window with his name, age, level and skills. The age line that caught his special attention was the one that said he was 19 years old. This meant that he had gone back in time 16 years. Afterward, he laughed an evil laugh. Vihexu didn't expect this and was confused. The thought went through his mind that Kim was crazy for laughing like that. But that didn't deter him in any way. He was ready to continue beating Kim. But his pride and loss of concentration played tricks on him. Being absolutely sure of his superiority, Beihexu didn't pay attention to anything, so he missed Kim's punch. The blow was strong enough that Beihexu didn't just fall to the ground, he flew at least five meters away. His friends looked on in astonishment. Kim watched with great enjoyment as his assailant got what he deserved. He grinned devilishly, revealing his white teeth. But that wasn't the only thing that lifted his spirits. He quickly analyzed the situation, remembered recent events, and realized that he too was an awakened one. Time seemed to stand still. Not a single sound could be heard. Only the passing wind occasionally broke the silence. Kim clenched his fist and rubbed the spot where he had been slapped recently. Foy Haksu's friends stood still for a while and then rushed at the protagonist with a frantic desire to avenge their friend. The one on the left had some sort of ice ability and the one on the right had the opposite power, the power of fire. The first to oppose the protagonist was the one with the fire power, throwing a fireball at him. But Kim quickly dodged it, just like his friend. This guy neglected his own defense, and so he received a blow to the jaw, even heard his teeth crack slightly. 
the last guy from this company, also intended to harm our protagonist. But like the previous two, he did not think about his own defense, so he also received a blow, but already in the stomach. Even though it was clear that these dumbasses didn't think about their own defense, Kim's punches didn't look like a simple element of defense, but like a refined martial art, and there was an explanation. By the time he was 35, he'd done everything he could in his entire unawakened life, starting with physical training and ending with studying information about the abyss, its monsters, and data on various skills. In addition to that, he also practiced fighting skills in various martial arts. Meanwhile, the guys came to their senses, and like complete idiots, once again decided to try to harm our protagonist. Like last time, this attempt failed. Considering that these two did not know even the basic fundamentals of offense and defense, it was not difficult for a person skilled in martial arts to defeat such idiots. And so, after a few attempts, they fell to the ground, unconscious. Of course, Kim was pleased that he had been able to teach those who had disrespected him a lesson, but at the same time he realized that there was no limit to progress, and he would have to train again to improve his skills and learn new ones. At first glance, it seemed that everything was over. Behexu had lost consciousness a few minutes ago, and his friends couldn't even deal with the man who hadn't used a single magic ability against them. But it was still just beginning. The suddenly awake Behexu stood up leisurely, wiping his face with his hand, and he was very unhappy with how the protagonist dared to hurt him. Now Behexu had finally used his ability, covering his body with a stone skin. His gaze was full of madness, and the desire to destroy Kim, covering his fist with the stone skin, Behexu swung at him, cutting the air in his path. The first blow followed, and at the last moment, our protagonist dodged. A second blow followed, which Kim also managed to dodge. But these punches were just a warm-up for Bei Haksu. Instead of attempting the single strike again, he jumped up and swung two fists, ready to do damage to the area. Upon landing, Bei Haksu landed a powerful punch exactly where Kim was standing. A huge amount of dust rose into the air, while Bei Haksu stood still and breathed heavily. Even for him, this attack must have been difficult, but he was confident that he had finally succeeded in defeating his target. However, this feeling turned out to be wrong. Like a ninja appearing out of nowhere, Kim sneaked up on his enemy unnoticed. Faihaksu was surprised to see that the protagonist was still alive. But without dwelling on the thought for long, he instantly turned around, frantic to strike again. Kim was quicker, and taking his opponent by surprise, he struck first. Except that his face did not express a sense of victory, no, it was a sense of surprise. The blow delivered by the protagonist did not do any harm to his enemy. Bei Hexu smirked devilishly as he watched Kim's fist slowly get covered in blood. Alas, the protagonist's punch was useless against the stone skin. He only hurt himself. But Kim quickly forgot about these considerations when he saw Bei Hexu intending to attack him again. Kim adopted a defensive posture in hopes of deflecting his opponent's blow, and it helped, but only partially. The blow was so strong that Kim flew to the other end of the roof. After just one precise blow, he was lying on his back, bleeding, and looking at his opponent with horror in his eyes. When the protagonist first fought back, Bai Haksu thought he had truly become awakened. But after defeating him with a single blow, he changed his mind. You're nothing. You're not an awakened one. You deserve to be crushed like a nasty insect forever, said Bai Haksu, looking at the protagonist with disdain. He was still wondering what Kim would do now. Would he run away again? Or would he continue trying with his awakened skills to defeat him? Bai Haksu thought of numerous options in his head as to what Kim would do next. Bei Haksu's skill was much stronger than Kim had originally imagined. This world was organized as follows. All awakened people were given skills and levels, starting from rank F, where the awakened were almost indistinguishable from ordinary humans, to rank S, who were considered monsters. Physical abilities and skills grew exponentially, and all our protagonist got was a skill unknown to anyone, and a worse rank. Bei Haksu had a rank of C. And logically, he was much stronger than the F rank holder that Kim was. However, even though there was such a weighty rank difference, he felt that he wouldn't lose to him. A mysterious vortex formed around him, and his body was enveloped in red flames. It was the first time Bei Hexu was so surprised. He didn't fully believe that Kim was capable of being awakened, but right before his eyes, something he didn't believe was happening. Kim could feel the magic listening to him as it flowed through his veins. He didn't fully understand how the predator skill he had learned worked. However, that question immediately fell away when Bai Haksu once again decided to strike. To test what the skill was capable of, the protagonist decided to test it on the nearest enemy. 
At the same second, a mysterious and strange energy appeared from his hand. This energy had a truly amazing power, because the stone armor that was impenetrable before began to slowly disintegrate. With each passing second, the power of the energy only increased. Kim didn't stop for a second. He finally got a chance to teach the one who was bullying him a lesson. A few moments later, there was no trace of the stone armor, and a look of horror appeared on Bai Haksu's face. Meanwhile, the students of the school continued to go about their business without even realizing that a truly amazing event was taking place not far from them. A huge red tornado appeared in the same place where Kim and Bei Haksu were standing, and for a moment, the entire sky was colored maroon. In time, the tornado disappeared, leaving behind a huge cloud of dust in the air. Fei Hexu suffered a devastating defeat. His armor was destroyed in just a few moments, and he lost all his strength and was unable to continue the fight. Unconscious, he fell to the floor. It wasn't easy, but the protagonist was still victorious. The devouring was completed. As a result of absorbing the target, Kim's rank changed to rank E. However, this was not the last surprise. Along with gaining a new rank, he also commandeered a new stone skin ability. The further narration of the story continued in the school's infirmary. Inside sat a beautiful nurse, with black silky hair, and her face expressed quite a bit of surprise. Kim walked inside, along with those three guys. One he left at the entrance, the other two he continued to carry on his shoulders. All three were unconscious. Kim himself looked no better than they did. Battered, covered in dust, with blood slowly dripping from the left side of his face, the first thing he did was to say hello to the nurse. The nurse was stunned for a few seconds, and then her surprise increased many times over, and understandably so, because it wasn't every day you got to see something like this. So, how did the story develop after the fight? After winning, he carried all the guys, including Bei Haksu, to the infirmary. While the others lay unconscious in the medical beds, the nurse cured the protagonist with her healing skills. Of course had to lie to her, so when asked how he and the three others had hurt themselves, Kim replied that they had rolled down the stairs. She had a hard time believing this theory, but he managed to talk her into continuing the treatment without too many questions. Some time passed, and our protagonist headed home. The day didn't look so gloomy anymore. He was fully healthy, became awakened, and got even with Bai Haksu. However, despite all this, there was one problem, and that problem was the predator, a skill that Kim had acquired as soon as he arrived in this time. Not only was that strange, his rank, which he couldn't raise by training all his past life, was able to change after the first fight. Perhaps Predator was indeed a rank F skill, but its strength was no less than a rank C skill. But not only did the skill have a pretty good strength, but it could also absorb other people's skills. Why did that guy, the king, give him such strength? Why did he bring him back to this time? There were so many questions in Kim's mind, but there was still no answer to any of them. With each passing moment, there were more and more questions, and in the end, there was only one thing left to do. To learn more about the Predator, he returned to his home. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've been home, said Kim. When his parents died, he stayed to live with his uncle. It was a strange feeling. Everything that had happened lately had made him uneasy, but looking at the house, it was as if he had forgotten everything for a few moments and felt a warmth somewhere deep in his soul. His uncle was due back late, and since no one was supposed to be in the house, Kim intended to look for information about skills that might shed some light on what was going on. As he went inside and looked around the corner, our protagonist became more than a little alarmed. In the middle of the room, there were four people. A guy looking a little younger than our Kim, a man sitting on a chair, and two strangers in strange costumes. This guy was an acquaintance of our protagonist, and he was very surprised that Kim had suddenly appeared. Huang Jiyun, that was the guy's name, was our protagonist's cousin. They had both known each other for a long time and Kim wondered why his cousin wasn't at school. For a few seconds, Kim just stood there, not understanding what was going on. But then, it was as if his eyes were filled with the full realization of what was going on here. His attention was drawn to a small box with metal coins and paper money scattered around it. He remembered that back in his past life, his cousin wanted to make friends with other bandits, so he took all the money from the house and got into huge trouble. Meanwhile, the man on the left dressed in a strange suit asked Huang Jai Yun, Who is this? Who would have thought that the unpleasant event firmly fixed in Kim's memories was today? As Kim continued to watch, Huang Jai Yun quickly explained to those guys that the man who had suddenly appeared was his cousin. Huang Jai Yun stayed with those guys in the strange costumes, and their leader came forward. He went to our protagonist and told him to get out of here immediately. They will take everything they need and then leave. 
The ringleader felt confident against Kim, for he believed him to be unawakened and would give him no trouble. For a while, Kim just stood still, looking at the ringleader in silence. But then a smile appeared on his face, for the ringleader was deeply mistaken in thinking that Kim was not awakened, which was to his advantage. The ringleader had made the same mistake as the others who had faced Kim in the battle. He had neglected his own defense. That's why he missed the punch. His sense of superiority in the face of the supposedly unawakened protagonist played a cruel trick on him, so that Kim punched him in the face with all his might, and he fell to the floor, hitting his head hard. Both Huang Jiayun and those two in the strange suits were incredibly surprised at what had happened before their eyes within a couple of moments. The previously confident face of the head immediately changed to a grimace of surprise mixed with horror. Kim caught him off guard. Now he wasn't threatening him, feeling like someone special, but asking him to stop. He didn't think of stopping. Firstly, there was a desire to teach the ringleader a lesson, and secondly, he just wanted to test the predator. The leader was ideally suited for the role of the test subject. His henchmen were not in a hurry to help, and he himself could not run away, and therefore our protagonist had a feeling that now everything would end in his favor. But only everything turned out to be quite the opposite. The predator function, for some unknown reason, was unavailable, and as soon as Kim saw this, his confidence immediately disappeared. The leader looked at Kim in bewilderment, not understanding what he was about to do. Kim was equally perplexed, for the skill that had worked on Bai Haksu before, for some unknown reason, did not activate this time. From this unexpected turn of events, Kim lost concentration, and the headman took advantage of it. While Kim was trying to figure out what had happened, the ringleader gave him a quick sidekick to the face. It wasn't as hard as the blow from Bai Haksu, whose fist was covered in stone skin, but it wasn't unpleasant either. The ringleader was angry. At the beginning of the encounter, he had been willing to let him go if he didn't make any unnecessary moves, but now he intended to destroy him. The first henchman used the chain skill. The action of his skill looked like normal chains, but only they appeared from his hands and glowed red. The second henchman of the ringleader applied the skill poison. He looked like a purple cloud of thick smoke. Finally, the ringleader himself entered the battle, applying the bleed skill which looked like long, sharp plants with thorns. All three skills used against Kim had a rank C, the same rank as Bei Hexu. Kim had just gotten up and hadn't yet seen that three skills had been used against him at once. Raising his head and seeing this, an indescribable horror appeared in his gaze. Inside the house, there was a powerful clap. It did not destroy the walls, but the shockwave was clearly heard outside, and several barrels standing on the roof flew into the air. The room was filled with thick purple smoke. The man standing to the right of the leader wondered, how dare an unawakened man pretend to be awakened? The leader was somewhat surprised at what had happened, but he thought that the three skills used simultaneously, if not destroying Kim, then wounding him very badly. But it wasn't as good as he'd imagined. His confident gaze changed in a few moments to one of indescribable surprise or horror. Through the thick, almost impenetrable smoke, they saw a silhouette standing there. Though the predator had not activated earlier, it had noticed the use of several skills at once, and through mystical power, it granted Kim resistance to each of the three skills. The predator worked in a truly strange way. First it suddenly didn't work, and then it neutralized the skills. The protagonist still didn't understand what was going on, or how the skill he had gotten actually worked. But one thing was certain. The leader, who thought he was too important, deserved to be punished. So Kim swung his fist with all his might and punched him in the face, knocking him to the floor. Kim's gaze was one of absolute confidence and enjoyment. Finally, he had a chance to teach the idiot who thought he was special a lesson, but it was not clear what the head's gaze was expressing, whether it was horror or whether he had lost consciousness after the first blow. But there was a knocked-out tooth, a huge mark on his face from the blow with a stone hand and blood oozing from his nose. Some time came, the fight did not last long, and our protagonist came out of it victorious. All three lay unconscious, and during this time, Kim learned two things. The status window was only visible to the awakened. It displayed information about the awakened, but not all of it. The first thing Kim recognized was that there was no lack of mana. The first time he tried to use the skill against the ringleader, it was enough, but the predator still didn't activate. In other words, there was something other than mana in the activation conditions besides what was written. On top of that, the predator's passive effect wasn't listed in the description. However, Kim was able to understand that it neutralized all negative effects such as bleeding or poison. Even though Kim had figured out some details of his skill, it wasn't enough to understand the true power of the predator. 
so he believed that he would be able to confirm his assumptions in time. However, that wasn't what worried him at that moment. There was something more important. He was pulled from his musings by his cousin, who knelt down and bowed before Kim. Seeing what the protagonist was capable of, he repented of what he had done, begging to be forgiven. To make amends, the cousin was ready to lick his shoes, or bark like a dog, simply put, whatever he was told to do. And while he was trying to apologize for what he had done, Kim was looking at him with a look of disappointment. Of course, Huang Jiayong had done wrong, almost getting himself into huge trouble. But that wasn't what our protagonist was worried about. He was very much concerned about what was about to happen. And while passers-by were going about their business, as if nothing was wrong, going out with friends, Kim knew that a terrible danger was coming. Kim took pity on his cousin and forgave him, to which Huang Jiayong was very much surprised. However, he was not going to forgive him just like that. In return, he said that the cousin would go with him. And while Kim was talking to his cousin, our story moves to another place. It was a two-story building that looked like a warehouse, but it was clearly an unusual building. Only authorized persons could enter it. Inside the building, there were three people. In the center stood a man dressed in a business suit with glasses on his head. And behind him stood two girls, whose facial expression expressed a slight fear, unlike the man. A few steps away from them, monsters were coming out of the portal. This event was called Gate Breakthrough. It's a phenomenon where a path from the abyss suddenly opens for monsters. If nothing is done, things can cross into a dungeon disaster. Ten years have passed since the last disaster. That time, a gate suddenly appeared, and monsters began to sprawl out, wreaking havoc and panic. The girl with blonde hair said that considering the monsters, if they didn't do anything, the disaster was only a couple of moments away. The second girl also understood the seriousness of the threat, so she suggested evacuating the nearby areas. The man said that there was no need to do so, for they had his B-rank skill called Barrier. After that, it was clear why he felt so confident. The monsters couldn't break through the protective barrier, so he didn't feel threatened by them. Furthermore, the rank of this gate was C, and therefore the strongest monster that could come out of there had to be rank C as well. But not everything was as perfect as it might seem at first glance. A few monsters that were strong enough hit the barrier with all their strength, and cracks started to form. A couple of moments later, the barrier split, and dozens of monsters pounced on the man, while the girls standing nearby immediately trembled in fear. But the man's face did not tremble for a second. He did not even move an eyebrow in front of such huge and terrible creatures. One twisting swing of his foot, and he killed several monsters at once. In case the barrier still couldn't contain the monsters, the man counted on his own strength. For he was sure that with a rank B, he and those girls would be able to hold off the breakthrough. Our story is now transferred to the protagonist and his cousin. From their conversations, it was clear that they were discussing just the gate from which the monsters began to come out. While they were running, the protagonist told his cousin that there was already a personnel manager at that facility, so Huang Jiayong thought everything would be fine. Huang Jiayong was partially correct. The original mana of that gate was at rank C, and the staff that arrived there was rank B, so monsters ranked lower were not a hindrance to them. That was exactly what Huang Jiayong wanted to say. Honestly, he had no idea why they were running there at all. However, after a couple moments, the protagonist told him something that made his pupils dilate and his heart beat more frequently. Kim said that monsters really weren't a hindrance to the staff, only if the gate was actually rank C. Meanwhile, the man interrupted the remaining monsters along with his female assistants. Defeating the monsters didn't please him at all. There was something that bothered him very much. He looked at the corpse of the monster with interest, wondering how a low-level monster managed to break through his rank B barrier. Then he realized something that made him feel a shivering chill all over his body. From the open gate, the outgoing mana was a rank higher than him. After interrupting the first wave of monsters, he also surrounded the gate with a barrier once again. But now, much larger monsters began to emerge from there. And among these monsters, there was one giant who just had to push the barrier a little bit to make a long web of cracks. The situation was taking a bad turn before they were confident in their abilities, but now they were not. The huge monster opened its mouth full of sharp teeth and let out a heartbreaking roar. Now the man felt a real, bone-chilling terror, which bound him in strong, invisible chains. With his roar, the giant shattered the barrier, thus opening the way for a crowd of terrible monsters. The giant ogre was truly a huge monster, even against the background of its fellow monsters. The man didn't fully want to believe what was happening, but at the same time, he understood perfectly well. 
that such a huge monster was under no circumstances capable of possessing a C-rank. He had originally prepared for easy difficulties, but this was something he had clearly not expected. A tremendous explosion rang out in the building, and debris flew in all directions. Then, our story turned back to the protagonist and his cousin. Wang Jiayun suggested that Kim was right, and the gate was indeed ranked higher than C. But first of all, that sounded stupid. And second of all, how did he know all this? Except, Huang Jiayun didn't know that the protagonist had already been through all this before, and knew what would actually happen. But he couldn't tell his cousin that he was essentially back from the future. So he lied, and said that his intuition told him so. The protagonist's cousin didn't believe him right away. But there was nothing he could do about it. It was the only option that could be said. Huang Jiayong didn't believe Kim's words to the last, exactly until he saw people running away from the ruthless monsters. There were cries of pain and despair, and the people's faces were filled with unbearable horror. Huang Jiayong was stunned, unable to believe his own eyes, and understandably, he didn't know that this was going to happen, unlike Kim, who tried to keep a cool head and asked his cousin if he remembered what to do. What are you going to do? Huang Jiayun uttered, with a very strong shudder. His gaze was a mixture of animal terror and monstrous surprise. Kim was not going to stand idly by, and he intended to destroy all the evil that dared to appear from the otherworldly dimension. Covering his right arm with a stone skin, he walked straight towards the monsters with a confident gait. Meanwhile, an equally interesting event was taking place. It took place in a tall building that stood out from the rest of the city. Standing near the window was a man with dark hair and dressed in classic office clothes. He was already aware of the gate breach. The situation was rapidly escalating, and it was impossible to send reinforcements as the others were busy in the dungeons or studying the abyss. Considering all the circumstances, the only solution to the crisis was an awakened rank A. The man turned to the man standing behind him. This was their last hope. The person the man placed his hopes on was Anhensu, nicknamed Blade of Madness. The man couldn't hold back his tears, and said that the hero Anhensu was coming to help. The peculiarity of this awakened man was that he had the syndrome of an 8th grader, which was probably why he would involuntarily cry from time to time. Then the narrative of the story returned to our protagonist. There were all sorts of monsters opposing him. Some looked like huge frogs with sharp fangs, some like huge werewolves. Some of the monsters looked like huge goblins that were often seen in fantasy stories. But none of them could resist Kim's power. The anger hidden somewhere deep in Kim's soul found release in this battle. Kim swung his arm and activated the predator skill, thus causing a tornado around him, so strong that the monsters began to fly apart. In addition to the pleasure he felt from destroying the merciless creatures, he found out another feature associated with the skill he had received. At some point in front of him appeared a plate with information about fatigue. And then our protagonist realized that if it exceeded 70%, the skill was not activated. Most skills used mana, and it was the main magical resource. But that didn't mean you only had to worry about it, because in addition to the magic resource, there was fatigue, which increased when using a skill or movement. And the higher it was, the more the power of skills decreased, and the heavier the body became. Of course, these details made a lot of things to think about. You couldn't just look at the amount of mana and know if a skill could be used or not. But luckily, Kim realized that he could absorb the bodies of monsters, thus restoring mana without spending it. However, there was something even better something that made our protagonist smile all over his face. Kim increased his rank, thus increasing the power of his predator and stone skin skills. The more he used predator, the stronger he became. Considering how quickly he was able to increase his rank, Kim assumed that at this rate, he could become S or even SS ranked. But at some point, there was hope in his heart that he could become the first SSS rank. No one had ever been able to achieve such strength before. At any rate, the deed was done. All that was left of the monsters that had sowed panic before were dents in the roads and purple blood smeared on the surface, and since there was nothing more to do here, it was time to return to Huang Jiayun. Kim was about to go to his cousin, but his attention was caught by a sound somewhere nearby. He looked up and saw a huge monster falling to the ground, and the guy who was fighting it. It was the same monster that had managed to break through the gate, thus releasing the other monsters into the city. The guy who fought the monster was An Hensu who had been sent to deal with the aftermath of the gate-breaking. His eyes were filled with grief as he couldn't accept that people had died, so his goal was to take revenge on the monster. While the monster was falling, and An Hensu was shouting, Kim stood there bewildered. However, the monster didn't plan to give up so easily. 
as he swung around and prepared to hit An Hensu. An Hensu was not going to give up the victory to the ruthless monster. He could not let the human killer live. An Hensu activated the skill, and everything around him glowed with a golden color. A few seconds later, a powerful discharge struck from the sky. It was so bright that for a moment it was daylight in the night city. The protagonist stood among the ruins after the powerful shock, and his face expressed only one thing. Surprise. Realizing that this guy had easily defeated a rank A monster, Kim remembered that it was the same awakened one who had resolved the gate break in his previous life. Kim couldn't move from his emotions as he watched An Hensu plunging his shining sword into the immobile body of the huge monster. An Hensu was very pleased that he was able to deal with the monster so quickly, and while An Hensu was standing on the body, Kim couldn't understand one detail. Why was this guy even here? And he was surprised because in his past life, An Hensu had fought an ogre in another part of the city. The detail he'd noticed was still bothering him. Instead of breathing a sigh of relief, he only asked himself more and more questions. And then, as if a thousand needles were pierced under his skin, and all his instincts screamed of imminent danger because the predator felt the use of a skill, but neither Kim nor An Hensu used anything from their arsenal. After a few seconds, it became clear why the protagonist's skill was trying to warn of danger. Like a ghost suddenly appearing out of nowhere, a man appeared behind An Hensu's back stabbing him with a dagger. The expression on the guy's face showed that he clearly didn't expect something like this. Got you, An Hensu, said the man in a quiet yet manic voice, while smiling all over his face. It was as if the city had turned into a huge deserted jungle. There were no people on the street. Only a huge cloud of dust flew past the skyscrapers every now and then. For a while, the narration of our story is transferred to a small store with clothes. Huang Jae Yong stood in the middle of the small room, and there was a girl lying on the couch next to him. It was the school nurse who treated our protagonist after the fight with Bai Haksu and his friends. And while the girl was unconscious, Huang Jae Yong was clearly worried about something. A question flashed through his mind. Is it really true? He wondered because he remembered his cousin's words before they reached the square where the monsters were. After stopping for a while, Kim told his cousin that many people would die today, and one of them would be their school nurse, Choi Nayan. He knew she was going to die because he had already lived through these events in his past life, and she will die because she will be helping others instead of evacuating. Huang Jiayun, who was listening to all this, was shocked to say the least. But there was no time for an explanation, and Kim immediately asked if he could put people to sleep with his sleep skill. To that question, Huang Jiayun answered in the affirmative. Okay, then put her to sleep and evacuate her, and I'll handle the rest. Kim then said to his cousin. Huang Jiayun did exactly as Kim told him. And now their school nurse was lying unconscious on the couch, and Huang Jiayong, who was standing nearby, kept wondering, how did Kim know about all this? For a few minutes? He wondered and couldn't find a good answer. But then a thought struck him. It makes sense, because there's no other way to explain it, Huang Jiayong thought, as he looked at the nurse. The only other option he could think of was that Kim had become awakened with the skill of foresight. This thought was very firmly fixed in his mind. And since he didn't know that the protagonist had returned from the future. This was the most logical option for him. In any case, looking at the moon, he thought it was unlikely that anything could go wrong. Except that something did go wrong. Kim watched on Hensu and the man who had suddenly appeared behind him closely, clutching the wound site tighter to stop the bleeding, and Hensu asked the stranger who he was. The man was in no hurry to answer the question. He was more surprised that on Hensu was still alive, even with his vital organs pierced although he also realized that A-rank awakened ones were quite different. But this way, it was only more fun for him. This B-rank villain's name was Han Sando, and his main skill was stealth. Awakened ones who committed a crime in this world were called villains. Han Sando was one of them. He was a deadly maniac who killed people for his own pleasure when the gate was breached. But Kim was sure that Han Sando and An Hensu had never met in their past lives. Did the future change because of me? wondered the protagonist realizing that something that was supposedly not supposed to happen was now happening. Han Sando's smug and self-righteous look made him angry. He activated the sword and swung it at the villain's head. The next moment, however, something happened that made him forget all about getting even with the one who had pierced his body. Even Han Sando, who was clearly eager to get even with the awakened man, also froze in place, forgetting his original intentions. The huge monster that had been lying on the ground all this time was alive. Rising up from the ground, he threw An Hensu and Han Sando off of him. Then he let out a roar of incredible volume that could be heard in any part of the city. 
While An Hensu was unpleasantly surprised by the giant's sudden return to the battlefield, Han Sando seemed to be happy about it, just the kind of regeneration he expected from a rank A monster. During the time the monster was unconscious, it had managed to accumulate enough strength to strike. Han Sando and An Hensu were able to bounce back at the last second, but if they had been unconscious for just a little bit longer, they would have been left with a huge pool of blood. Although Han Sando was happy that the monster had suddenly woken up, he was unwilling to fight with it because monsters among humans did not have a friend or foe. For them, any human was an enemy. So Han Sando decided to leave the giant to that guy. Even though he didn't succeed in defeating Anhensu, there was something that made him smile a devilish smile. Turning around, Han Sando noticed the protagonist watching the scene. Great, the more casualties the better, Han Sando said, pouncing on Kim. For a moment, the protagonist was terrified, for it was no longer a monster of animal instincts against him. It was a calculating, ruthless and cold-blooded killer, and anything could be expected from him. Han Sando was about to touch Kim's face with his dagger blade, only a few centimeters remained. But thanks to his good reaction, Kim managed to grow stone skin at the very last moment. When Han Sando attacked him, he felt a momentary fear as he didn't expect to fight a human. But realizing that Han Sando wasn't a serious threat, he quickly deflected the first blow and turned around to kick the villain in the jaw. Han Sando jumped back to a safe distance, realizing that the man in front of him was not an ordinary man, but an awakened one. The blow was certainly not fatal, not even breaking his jaw, but the feeling was unpleasant. Han Sando raised his hand and wiped the spot where the blood had dripped. B-rank villain, Han Sando. A psycho who loves to kill using his stealth skill. That's you, isn't it? The protagonist asked the villain, heading towards him and covering his arm with a stone skin. Great to meet you, said Kim, looking the assassin straight in the eye. Han Sando tried to strike from the side, but the attempt failed. The stone skin easily withstood the dagger's strike. He noticed that Kim's head was not protected by the stone skin, so he jumped up and swung his dagger at it. Han Sando's movements were very fast, but our protagonist was in time to notice the attack from above, immediately crossing his arms in a defensive position. Each of them demonstrated mastery of their skill, or weapon like a true master. Han Sando acted very quickly, but Kim was losing his grip, also quickly defending himself. It turned into a sort of cycle, with Han Sando striking first, and Kim defending, then it would repeat, but in reverse. During the time they fought, Han Sando admitted to Kim that he was quite skillful for having lasted so long in a fight with him. The villain was somewhat surprised that the blades that had previously killed hundreds, if not thousands of people, didn't work on his new target. And while somewhere in the background An Henso was battling the giant, Han Sando decided to talk to Kim for a few moments. I don't know how you realized who I am, but you probably think you have a chance to win, the villain said to our protagonist. Kim answered nothing and continued to stand in a defensive stance preparing for another attack from his opponent. Suddenly, Han Sando smiled even wider and said the following to Kim, You should have realized that the world doesn't follow plans. And then, in the blink of an eye, he vanished into thin air, disappearing as suddenly as he had appeared before. The protagonist tried not to lose concentration as he realized that Han Sando was serious since he decided to use his stealth skill. But even such a seemingly very strong skill never once frightened Kim. Swiftly turning around, he was sure he had detected the enemy and struck in that direction. Suddenly, Han Sando's voice behind him was like ice water on Kim's body. It was too fast, too sudden, and he was able to turn around at the very last moment, putting his right arm under the blow. There was only one thing. The stone skin that had previously withstood the dagger's blows suddenly gave a gap, thus allowing Han Sando's body to be wounded. Meanwhile, Han Sando was building up his strength. The first strike was just a warm-up. It became so fast, that it left behind several body images. The movements were so fast and elusive that it was impossible to realize where Han Sando was actually located. The protagonist was barely holding back the onslaught of the enemy, whose force and speed of blows were increasing with every passing moment. But Kim could not hold out forever. Han Sando understood perfectly well that all skills had weaknesses. It was only necessary to find it and then relentlessly hit the right place. Gradually, the blood on the floor became more and more. It seeped between the cracks in the tiles, or slowly dried up due to the light wind passing by. Kim could barely stand on his feet. His breathing was ragged and intermittent, and his heart was beating as fast as if it were ready to burst through his chest. Even in such a situation, our protagonist did not lose heart, although he was still very surprised. It is understandable, 
because who could know that the stone skin has such a disadvantage? As it turns out, the stone skin didn't block the blow completely. The unbearable shock broke the stone, and the destroyed part was replaced by a stone of noticeably reduced strength. What happened was exactly what was mentioned earlier. Han Sando didn't act like monsters, driven by animal instincts. He made sure that Kim's body was under all kinds of stress from the very beginning. But now, Kim was confident that he could withstand a one-on-one -on -one fight against a B-ranked fighter. Because his physical abilities were far above the average D-rank, Han Sando was sure that his victim had only seconds to live, and so the smirk of satisfaction was still on his face. But in a moment, it disappeared because Kim asked Han Sando only one question, and it was as follows. Well, I guess we should stop playing games, don't you think? Han Sando was confused for a few seconds, but then he lunged at Kim, thinking that his victim, who had been stumped, was gradually going insane. As Han Sando ran at Kim with all speed, the latter was in no hurry to go anywhere, and asked the villain another question. B-rank villain Han Sando, do you know why I wanted to meet you? Han Sando did not answer this question, but only continued running. And then something happened that made Han Sando's pupils dilate, his body goosebumps, and his heart beat even more frequently. For the first time since the battle began, Kim used the predator skill, answering the question of why he wanted to face the villain. It was simple enough. He wished to take his skill. From such a surprise, Han Sando stopped, feeling how an aura of sinister mana was building up around him. This did not frighten him at all, for the manic smile that had disappeared immediately returned to him. Han Sando didn't know what skill Kim was using, but he was confident in his skill, and once again started jumping back and forth, leaving behind several body images, confident that he couldn't be hit. Then Kim asked him, didn't he himself say that all skills have weaknesses? He realized this when he was absorbing monsters. Some of them kept leaving his field of vision, but eventually the predator caught up with them all. Simply put, wherever the victim was hiding, wherever she ran, the predator always found his prey no matter what. After these words, Hansando realized that all this time, Kim was not a victim at all. He was a ruthless predator who was slowly and leisurely analyzing his prey. In a burst of both rage and despair that descended on the villain, he tried to stab the protagonist with his dagger, but everything was already decided. The battle between Han Sando and Kim was over. Some time had passed, and the sun had risen in the heavens, illuminating the vast city with its morning rays. Among the ruins left after the night battle lay some guy. It was Anhensu fighting the giant. He was alive, but his appearance was not good to say the least. His strength was slowly leaving him, and blood was flowing rapidly on both sides of his face. And Hensu could no longer stay conscious after his injuries, and after a few moments, he passed out. While not far away from him, walking on the ruins with his huge feet, the giant who was still alive was approaching him. At last, he reached the one he had been fighting all this time. Seeing the enemy, who could no longer run away, the giant swung around and struck the spot where Anhensu was with all his might. A huge amount of dust rose into the air, and the giant roared viciously, satisfied that he had dealt with the enemy. A moment later, the giant monster had an amazing moment. There was a huge hole where he had struck, but there was no body, no bones, not even a drop of blood in the hole. Yeah, what a rude creature, walking here with its huge paws on the ground making a lot of noise. No respect for the others at all, said someone's male voice. Given the silence around him, Monster easily heard the voice. And turning around, he saw the protagonist and Han Sando. The skills were making their power known after all. Using his newly acquired stealth, Kim effortlessly stole the monster's victim right out from under his nose. The sun continued to rise in the sky, illuminating more and more of the huge city whose streets stretched for kilometers into the distance. The narrative of our story then shifts to a married couple whose astonishment was impossible to describe. Kim and his cousin stood before them. Huang Jae Young was happy to meet his parents. Then the protagonist asked his uncle if everything was fine. They couldn't hold back the tears of joy that appeared on their faces. They thought that the monsters had captured them, and they would never see Kim and Huang Jae Yeon again. But luckily, they both survived. But when they returned home, the couple found the house a mess, as if someone had turned the whole house upside down. Huang Jae Yeon said he had no idea what had happened. And Kim didn't tell what his cousin had originally wanted to do, because he realized he had already learned his lesson. As soon as the battle subsided, and some time passed, the breaking news immediately reported a huge gate breach after ten years. According to the government statement, the threat of a gate breach had been completely eliminated. However, given the possibility of another breach, the government ordered the nearest schools to close for a week, 
Also, the survivors began to successfully recover, and according to the government statement, the public could breathe a sigh of relief. Several men dressed in law enforcement uniforms approached Choi Nine and decided to ask her some questions, but she could not give a clear answer because when she woke up, she was already here. Also, right after the battle, all the news outlets were focused on the A-rank hero. Everyone thought that he had defeated the ogre giant, but An Hensu tried to tell everyone that the real hero was a completely different person. However, since the ogre giant's corpse had not been found, and the identity of the villain who had attacked the people was unknown, people were concerned that the security measures might not be enough. All the while, our protagonist was reading loud news headlines from his phone, slowly flipping through them. Unfortunately, none of the news releases mentioned him. Many people would have preferred to earn themselves extra fame points, but Kim preferred to stay in the shadows for now, not attracting too much attention. And it would seem that the long battle against the villain and the monster was over. One could rest, but not in the case of our protagonist. Instead of lying relaxed on the bed, he to a tunnel with a railroad, and by the numerous thickets around the tunnel, one could tell that no one had been in the place for a long time. During all the time Kim had been fighting, he had managed to increase not only his rank, but also his basic characteristics, which, though slightly, improved the situation at the moment of battle. He now had three skills. Gaining stealth was particularly successful, but at his current level, it was too difficult to use all three skills at once, because misuse would use up all of his mana and also increase his fatigue level, in which case it would end up being quite miserable. Although Kim had some pretty strong skills, but as mentioned before, it was impossible to use them at the same time. Fortunately, that wasn't too bad, because there was one solution. That solution was potions, elixirs created for various purposes, such as mana recovery or fatigue. They were quite expensive, which meant that our protagonist needed to make money. Except, there was one nuance. In order to hunt, Kim needed official permission, and even just using skills without the necessary authorization was considered illegal. Therefore, there was only one thing left for Kim to do. The most reasonable and available solution at that moment was to clear unexplored dungeons, and one of them was located in the depth of the tunnel Kim entered. The three Spider Sisters, B-rank monsters, appeared in his path. Two of them wondered how the mortal had found them. The one closest to him immediately wished to paralyze Kim and feast on him. Damn, B-rank isn't enough to change my rank. Am I going to have to kill a hundred of them? The protagonist wondered as he looked at the Spider Sisters. They were outraged by such insolence and immediately attacked Kim. One of the Spider Sisters was preparing to use an attack her cheeks beginning to inflate like balloons. A few moments later, the Spider Sisters released purple flames from their mouths, combining the three beams into one powerful projectile aimed at Kim. The Spider Sisters laughed loudly, certain that a mere mortal couldn't survive the attack of three monsters at once. They were looking forward to eating fresh human meat in the near future. But that's not what happened. Kim didn't move an inch, and he didn't get a scratch, all thanks to the mystical power of the Predator's resistance, which had helped him more than once. Just as I thought, you have a useful skill, said Kim, looking at the frightened Spider Sisters. The Spider Sisters, who considered themselves a superior unit against the supposedly helpless human, became confused, not knowing what to do. Then cries of pain and despair came from the tunnel, and the sounds of fierce fighting could be heard. In time, Kim dealt with the Spider Sisters, gaining a new skill, Paralysis. The story continued in a huge skyscraper, namely, the new South Korea Players Association. Two men of sturdy build stood guard near a wooden door, and a drawing of two dragons could be seen above their heads. Behind the huge wooden doors, a meeting was taking place between the two top players of the association. At the center of the table stood the deputy manager, a personnel officer of the new South Korea Players Association named Go Dae Wook. Players were called awakened ones who were allowed to use their skills for various purposes. For example, exploring the abyss, mopping up dungeons, and so on. At that point in history, there were five centers of such players in South Korea, including the largest Korean guilds, the four great guilds, fighters, the undivided, masters, the alchemists, magicians, wizards, informers, night vagabonds, and an authorized agency to manage the players, including the four great guilds. All together, this formed the new South Korean Players Association. Right now, there was a meeting going on between the two strongest players the head of the Knight Vagabonds Guild, and an S-ranked player named UN, and the chairman of the New South Korean Players Association, and an S-ranked player named Ji Jinhui. 
The man asked the woman if she recognized anything. You mean the Villain Guild? The woman asked in response. The Villains Guild was a criminal organization founded by the most badasses, even among the villains. Members of this guild wore gold rings with three skulls on them. Ji Jinwei pulled out some data documents, saying that they contained information about the Villains Guild's recent movements, as well as a list of the players they were targeting. Yu Ayan realized that the man had called her here, obviously not to personally hand over the documents. And if that was the case, then why did he call her here? In response, Ji Jinwei laughed lightly and said he wanted her opinion. Now that sounds interesting, Yu An said as she pondered what the man said with interest. Ms. N, when did you pass the player test? This question confused the woman for a few seconds, but then she calmly replied that she passed the test when she reached the age of qualification at 19. And then, realizing what he was really talking about, she became a little alarmed. Do you think a high school student can fight a monster? Ji Jinhui asked his co-worker. The narration of the story then moves to a dark cave where a guy with a backpack was sitting on a huge mountain of monster corpses. It was Kim who dialed a number to call one of the four great guilds, namely the alchemists. Kim explained the purpose of his call very simply. He wanted to buy some potions. So, a week had passed since the recent events, and the seven-day school closure due to the gate breach was officially over. The students, wearing their school uniforms and slinging their backpacks on their backs, leisurely headed towards the entrance. But what had happened in those seven days? Well, Kim wasted no time. While most were either partying with friends or lying on couches, he got busy with physical training. He then practiced his strength on monsters while doing a dungeon sweep. And no less important was a visit to one of the four major guilds, namely the alchemists. After seeing how many crystals Kim had brought them, the guild members were confused. And still in shock, they agreed to take him to VIP. No, SVIP to make a further deal with the alchemist. In exchange for the crystals, Kim procured the necessary potions. He also increased all of his base stats during this productive week. But his main accomplishment was the rank increase. But despite the hard work he had done, there was still a long way to go. And because Kim went back to the time when he was a high school student, he was forced to go to school. Meanwhile, rumors spread with great speed among the other students at the school that Kim had single-handedly wiped out Bei Hexu and his henchmen. If whatever happened, he's in big trouble, said the guy being clearly worried about something to which the girl responded with a legitimate question. Why? And the whole matter was that Kim's act had attracted the attention of one particular person. Kim noticed several people entering the classroom, and they were clearly not his classmates. They acted quite aggressively, heading towards Kim. They overturned desks and chairs, throwing them around the classroom. They were two guys from high school, and they looked very threatening. But they were no more than pawns. The one in charge was Lee Jongji. It was the person who made that guy nervous enough that his body could barely stand still. Long time no see, buddy, said Lee Jonjae, an S-rank awakened man. He was the leader of the Taesan High School gang, and also a third-generation influential person in the Taesan group, a large corporation sponsor of Taesan High School. But the protagonist knew him as more than just a man from an influential corporation. He knew his dark, real side in every detail. It was this man who was the main culprit, who had set Bei Haksu upon him, all for the sole reason that Kim was not awakened. I wonder since when am I your buddy? Don't talk shit and get lost. Lee Jongjae's mere presence awakened an unimaginable rage in Kim, which he wanted to unleash more and more with every passing second. One of the guys standing behind Lee Jongjae couldn't tolerate such insolence towards the boss and immediately showed his aggressive temper. However, he was quickly punished for daring to open his mouth. Can't you see that I'm busy having a conversation? Lee Jongjae said, wiping his shoes on the guy's face. He was showing his nature in all its glory. To him, all people were just insects that he didn't mind mocking at any moment. Having finished with that guy, Lee Jongjae returned to his conversation with the protagonist and said the following, I know that after defeating Bai Haksu, you are very enthusiastic. Except that there is one but. Is it necessary to taunt your opponent by looking at his face? Said Lee Jongjae, getting up from his chair. At the same moment, Kim felt the magic power of the awakened S rank. It was very much off the scale. Li Jongjie calmed down a bit and told him to listen when important things were being said to him. But Kim had no intention of listening to his interlocutor at all. From the moment Li Jongjie demonstrated his strength, Kim wanted to know what it would be like for his interlocutor to face a predator. And to answer this question, he had already activated the skill and was ready to pounce on Li Jongjie. But then their conversation was interrupted by a girl with blue hair who suddenly appeared, saying that it was time to stop all this. 
She made a few movements to get Li Junjie's henchmen out of the way. She simply pushed the first one away and covered the second one's hand with a thick layer of ice. This girl's name was Lima Young. Kim knew this girl, but she didn't evoke such negative emotions in him as Li Jungjae did. She was the head of the class, a rich girl, Yua Young's half sister, an awakened S grade, a model student, the most promising, and a future SS ranked player. She had many nicknames and would have even more as time went on. But with problems, she couldn't just pass on, leaving everything to fate. Lim Ayung made it clear to Lee Jung Jae that she would not allow him to behave inappropriately. Lee Jung Jae laughed a little and told her that she had misunderstood, that there was a slight misunderstanding and that it was just a conversation between friends. Lim Ayung didn't believe a word of it since she definitely saw him punch the guy in the face. Lee Jung Jae was already visibly starting to get annoyed by the girl's presence, but he tried not to show it. Maybe you shouldn't cross the line, don't you think? Lee Jung Jae asked. Lim Young made it clear again that this wouldn't end that easily, and either he would leave on his own or she would help him. A very tense atmosphere was developing between these two. The protagonist, who was watching all this, started to get a little nervous, because if these two started fighting, the class would be in danger of being defeated. Lee Jong Jae was still standing at his position, not intending to go anywhere. But Lim Young didn't intend to give up either. She couldn't just leave things as they were. All of a sudden, Lee Jong Jae turned around and headed out of the classroom, saying that he wouldn't waste time on another fight, except his words were a lie. He wasn't going to stop what he had started and was much more serious. A ball of fire appeared in his hand, and all he needed was one movement to throw it. Lim Young also began to prepare for the fight by activating her abilities. The air instantly became cooler, and a cold vapor appeared nearby. Kim still continued to sit on the chair as he watched the two of them. With each passing second, the tension was building, as if someone was ringing an invisible bell that served as a countdown to the beginning of the battle. But then there was one event that stopped the total rout of the class. A male voice spoke from a device attached to the wall, identifying itself as the broadcasting department. These devices were located in all parts of the school, and the voice announced that a special lecture would be given in the main hall by the Players Association. All students were requested to assemble in the main hall immediately. The man's voice was heard on every floor of the school, from the first to the fourth. Hearing the words Players Association, Lee Jong Jae stopped. From his facial expression, it was obvious that the Players Association meant something, since he stopped so suddenly. Lim Young, meanwhile, was still standing in a fighting stance as she prepared for an attack from her opponent. He stood in a stoic stance for a few seconds and then smiled. Consider yourselves lucky, said Lee Jun Jae as he headed towards the exit of the classroom and called his henchmen after him. Even as Lee Jong Jae moved a safe distance away, Lim Young still stood in a fighting stance, preparing for a possible attack. But after realizing that Lee Jong Jae had indeed left, she breathed a sigh of relief and turned to the protagonist, asking if he was okay. But turning around to the chair where he was sitting, she found no one there. Lim A Young was confused for a few seconds, then she heard Kim's voice, who was already near the exit of the classroom. What are you standing there for? Didn't you hear the announcement about the gathering in the main hall? he said to her. Turning to follow Kim's departing footsteps, she froze in place with a slight sense of strange incomprehension. After a few seconds, that feeling intensified many times over, so much so that her pupils dilated. Looking at the departing protagonist, she wondered if he had always been like this. The story then moves to the two-story building where all the students have been summoned. All the students lined up in several rows, and while they stood waiting, many discussions began among them regarding this special lecture organized by the Players Association, regarding the reasons why it all started. Half a minute later, a man spoke into a microphone on the stage. He introduced himself as the Deputy Director of Human Resources of the Players Association, and his name was Go Tai Wook. He said that there were two reasons why he had gathered the students in this hall. One was the lack of response to the gate breach, apology and safety training from the Players Association, and the second reason Go Tai Wook emphasized. For those who were going to take responsibility for future countries, Go to Wook informed about the changes in the player's exam. Standing in the middle of the crowd, Lee Jong Jae couldn't stop thinking about the protagonist. The mere thought of him caused his body to tremble and his fists to clench nervously. Lim A Young also couldn't stop thinking about him, and it seemed a little strange, so she decided to find out more about him later. While most of the students were listening intently to the words of the man on the stage, Kim was yawning every now and then showing his lack of interest in what was going on. 
a heated discussion immediately began among the students regarding the player's exam. The thing was that they didn't understand what it had to do with them. Since the exam was for those who had reached the age of 19, there was no way they could participate this year. Gotowuk interrupted their discussions by saying that the exam had something to do with them. Therefore, he is here to give guidance, all because of the recent gate breach and because of the sudden increase in monsters and dungeons. The Players Association recognized the unpleasant fact that they were short on people. Because of that, starting this year, they plan to allow even high school students to get recommendations. The students were surprised to hear such unexpected news. Gote Wook said that the recommendations for each school included a test of aptitude, grades, and behavior. They planned to select people based on complete numerical data. And while all the students were discussing the information they heard, Kim realized that it was all lies. The exam could be taken by high school students, but the selection process had already begun, right from the moment Go Tai Wook took the stage, all thanks to his skill. It was called Observer's Eye, and Go Tai Wook could see the numbers above the heads of each of the students present. Observer's Gaze was an ability that quantified the total number of abilities of whoever the skill holder was looking at, and with concentration, one could even see the player's status window information. Gotowuk looked around at the students present with interest. And to be honest, the numbers here were definitely better than other places. He saw them as people who would become excellent players in the future. But even among them, there were a few special people. The first such special one was Lee Jungjae, whose total score was 1924. The second was Lim Young, with a total score of 2335. And even before heading to school, he had gotten a list of recommended targets from the Night Wanderers, but such numbers were very high for an unprepared awakened one. That's why Go Ti Wook decided that he would have to write a letter of recommendation as soon as he returned to the association. The silence that had suddenly fallen over the students was dispelled by Lee Jong Jai, who addressed Go Ti Wook. He looked with interest at the young man who had decided to address him personally. Referring to his words that he would provide references for the player's examination, Lee Jong Jai asked him if there were any who were not at all suitable for the position. Lee Jongjae continued his remarks by saying that the player's exam is a test to determine whether any of the awakened are eligible to become a player. And in his opinion, an unawakened person did not need to hear information about this exam. A player is not only about his power. Of course, the awakened one's rank, ability to handle different situations, and extensive knowledge of the abyss played a role in whether the awakened one would become an excellent player. But all of these complex abilities had to be tested to qualify to become a player. Li Zhangjie continued his speech, attracting the attention of the whole hall. He said that the first difficulty was awakening. He then asked the representative of the association, If the unawakened dry it up, won't they suffer? With this question, he made several people laugh at the protagonist. Kim didn't bother to give an answer or show any activity. Looking at Li Zhangjie, he wondered, By pushing such a speech, do you want to test whether I am awakened? This was exactly what Li Zhangjie was going to do. He was pushing such a fiery speech, not only for the amusement of the audience, but also to reveal Kim's true abilities, if any. Lim Young intervened again and asked Lee jong to stop this circus. But instead of thanking her, the protagonist asked her why she did it. Did he ask for help? Lim Young took offense and turned away, deciding not to get involved in the squabble between the guys. Go Dai Wook listened to the young man carefully and said that he understood what he was saying but also added that attending this lecture was up to his own judgment. Lee Jongji turned around to Kim and asked if he was ashamed. He wouldn't be able to get references anyway, right? Or maybe he didn't care about things like player exams at all. Kim looked at Lee Jongji with a piercing gaze and wondered if it was possible. If you can't clearly prove that you're an awakened one, then you won't even have a chance to pass the exam. But at the same time, he realized that he didn't have to prove anything personally to get a recommendation. Most of the students standing in this hall were almost impossible to distinguish from each other, and to be honest, they resembled some kind of robots without any features. At the time, so this trinity clearly stood out from the crowd. Guotewuk looked at Lee Jong Jae with disappointment. Although he was an S rank holder, he was acting like a bully. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to our protagonist. According to the students, he was an unawakened one whose potential level was unknown. For the sake of interest, he tried to find out what this person's parameters were, but Go Te Wook couldn't see anything. His skill reported that it was impossible to confirm the information. For a moment he trembled, 
for what he saw, or rather didn't see, made him very surprised. For several seconds no sound was heard in the hall, when suddenly Kim spoke. He looked at Lee jong jae and said, You're right, I am obtuse. What good is listening to such information for the unawakened? It will only hit your pride in vain. These words came as a surprise to Lee jong jae for he had expected a completely different reaction. And since Kim had nothing to do here, there was only one thing left to do. He sent everyone and everything to hell, expressing his desire to get out of here. Lee jong jae's face literally turned into a grimace filled with endless surprise. He had expected anything, a verbal altercation, or a fight, but this was not something he could have foreseen. And while there was still tension in the air between the protagonist and Lee Jong-ji, Guo Tae-wook felt no better. His legs were shaking, his heart was racing, and sweat was dripping down his face. It was all because his observer's gaze hadn't worked. He was dumbfounded by this so much, because even the chairman of the association, a man obviously very strong, couldn't hide his overall score. The guild leader, who was also a very strong player, couldn't hide from the observer's gaze. And then the question hung in the air. How did this mere student manage to hide his overall score, to do what one of the strongest people in this world had failed to do before? This was the first time Guo tae -wook had seen something like this, and he couldn't relax, understandably. The shock he felt was immense. Meanwhile, Kim, who had become the main character of the meeting, was slowly heading for the exit. Everyone continued to think he was just an ordinary guy. In a desperate attempt, Go tae wook tried again to find out Kim's total score, but was unsuccessful. He tried again and again, but each attempt failed. But suddenly something happened that made Go tae wook shiver even more. It was unclear whether it was that Go tae wooks skill had managed to break through the defense, or whether Kim himself wished for his total score to be known. Our protagonist's total score was 5096, which was more than twice that of the strongest student of this school. As all the students gathered in the main hall, the school and courtyard were empty, not a living soul could be seen. After leaving the main hall, Kim decided to head to the library. There were shelves with a huge number of different books everywhere. Kim took about two dozen books and decided to spend his free time searching for clues about the king, who had sent him here for unknown reasons. But unfortunately, the quiet time spent reading books was clearly not meant for Kim. His tranquility was disturbed by Lee jong jaes henchmen. In addition to those two, a new guy with dark hair appeared among the company. The guy standing in the center, who appeared to have a broken nose, told the protagonist that Lee jong jae was looking for him, so he demanded to follow them. Trying to ignore them and turning a page in a book, he asked, What if I don't want to? While the two guys standing on the sides were not happy with this answer, the guy in the center was not confused and inhaled a full breath and said the following, You kinda run your aunt's restaurant, right? Upon hearing this question, Kim was shocked enough to make the blood in his veins catch for a moment and an unpleasant chill run through his body. He tried to ask a question, but the boy interrupted him. Lee jong jae knew that he had no parents, and his aunt was already having a hard time. Then, he asked if he really wanted to make her life difficult. The guy was so confident that he thought he didn't need to worry because they would make Kim go to their boss anyway. At the same second, there was a tremendous bang, the shockwave of which rattled the front doors to the library. The shelves of books that had stood still for years fell like dominoes. Kim felt a burning rage as he squeezed the boy's neck hard enough to cause as much pain as possible without breaking it. While those two lay unconscious, the last one was greedily gulping air, experiencing not fatal but hellish pain from suffocation. Kim was very angry, so he asked the guy not to make him ask twice. He asked him only one question. Where the hell is Lee jong jae After the urgent meeting organized by the Players Association was over, the hall instantly emptied out. No one even bothered to play, so the basketballs remained in their places. It was the perfect place to hold the meeting, no unnecessary eyes. It was in this hall that Lee jong ji was patiently waiting for the protagonist, in the company of a man dressed in a black suit. Noticing Kim approaching, the man with the bald head said it was amazing. Then Lee jong jae asked him, what was it? This A-rank player's name was Sol Hongdo, and he was Lee jong jae's bodyguard. Since Kim had arrived here, he had used the status lowering skill several times. He was surprised since the skill didn't work, and after analyzing the situation, he realized that if Kim had that level of resistance, he was probably an awakened A-rang. Lee jong jae laughed in relief, having gotten the answer to his question. Kim was an awakened one. Look, let's talk as friends, what do you say? Lee jong jae muttered. Kim's response to this question was silence, deep and prolonged. 
Li Zhongjai continued the conversation, saying that he had been a little harsh, but he didn't really mean to hurt him. Rather, he wanted to find out more about him. After graduation, Li Zhongjai had planned to create a guild that would be the successor to the Taesian group. But as he went on to say, even geniuses like him can't do everything alone. You know what I need? Li Zhongjai asked in an enthusiastic voice. Talent. He needed talented people, not losers like Bei Haksu. And people like him were perfect before becoming members of his future guild. Because of that, he suggested that the protagonist forget about old differences and join his team. Of course, as a powerful man, he promised him endless riches and great fame in the future. But most importantly, he promised that Kim's family could finally escape from living in the gutter. Li Zhongjai made an even more fiery speech than he had at the meeting in the hall. He was anticipating Kim's agreement, except Kim wouldn't believe that shit. Find out more? Wealth and fame? Kim didn't believe a word of it. It all sounded painfully perfect. But that wasn't the main reason. Of course, all these blatant lies only added fuel to the fire already burning inside Kim. But Li Zhongjai had done something more terrible. He had dared to cross a line that he clearly shouldn't have crossed. His pupils dilated. His body froze. And in general, Li Zhongjai experienced a slight shock after hearing this. But then he relaxed and breathed a sigh of relief, saying that Kim had gotten it right. After all, dogs need to be shown their place said Li Zhongjai, activating the skill and smiling evilly. Their fight was interrupted by Seol Hongdo, who had been standing nearby the whole time, trying not to interfere with the guy's conversation. He knelt down and activated a skill called Space. This skill was a barrier that surrounded the space with a shield. The magical forces within the shield were impossible to sense outside of it. Even though the hall was empty, he decided to reinsure himself and covered the space with a barrier, so that the entire school wouldn't know about the fight. After shaking the dust off his palms, he turned to Li Zhongjai and asked, where would they start the inspection? But turning around, he saw the guys had already entered the battle. Anger. Rage. That's how one could describe the range of emotions our protagonist felt when he came face to face with Li Yongjie. Li Zhongjai himself looked like a psychopath who was obsessed only with smashing the face of the man he hated so much. Li Zhongjai and Kim clashed their fists, and a tremendous shockwave was immediately generated. It was a fight between two awakened ones, each with tremendous power, but it looked like Li Zhengjie's punch was more powerful. Kim felt as if an electric shock ran through his body, and his stone skin began to crack. But this punch was just a warm-up, and Li Zhengjie was already preparing to deliver a twisting punch in the air, building up as much force as he could. He hit the target with all his strength in a single blow, so powerful that the explosion occurred a moment later. And if it wasn't for the protective barrier, the building would have been reduced to rubble in the blink of an eye. This blow was so strong that Kim spit out a huge amount of red liquid from his mouth several times. But the maddened Li Zhongjai didn't think of stopping. The blood that appeared only fueled his desire to beat Kim even more. Seol Hongdo stood motionless while a series of explosions rang out nearby. Even though he was the bodyguard of a very bad man, he still had human feelings in him. Seeing as the flames filled literally the entire hall, he felt sorry for Kim. He found it hard to believe that an awakened with a probable A rank and high body strengthening skills was a mere schoolboy. Watching this battle, he knew that it would soon end in Kim's favor. The protagonist wanted to strike from above, but Li Zhongjie had time to block the attack, and seeing the open area, he immediately realized where to strike. His hand was covered in bright flames, and his smile became even more sinister. He put all the mana and determination he had into this strike. Kim, you have no chance of winning against the S rank. Just learn your lesson and give up, Sol Hundo mentally said as he thought that the battle had ended with his master's triumphant victory. He was partially right. The battle was nearing its conclusion, but things had not happened as he had originally envisioned. As it turned out, the battle was still going on, and seemingly not in Kim's favor as Li Zhongjie continued to strike at lightning speed. The situation changed quickly. Kim repelled the attack and pushed Li Zhongjie to the center of the room. They were in an equal position each of them putting all their strength into the next strike. But Kim was faster, and noticing the gap in the defense of the opponent immediately caught him in a mistake, pushing him to the far side of the hall. Li Zhongjie tried to return to the attacking position and aimed a punch at Kim, but missed. That miss cost him dearly. Kim took advantage of his opponent's mistake, and with all his strength in his fist, hit him in the face. This blow sent him flying aside, raising a cloud of thick dust in the air as he landed. Solhundo was confused after what he had seen. He couldn't believe that some kid had managed to throw the Lord away. Meanwhile, 
Li Zhongjie was lying on the floor making barely audible moans. This was not the last surprise. After recovering a little from the blow, he tried to get up, but invisible forces prevented him from doing so. His body simply could not move. Saryul Hongdo was already in shock, but realizing that Li Zhongjie couldn't get up, his body was covered in goosebumps. He looked at Kim and wondered, was his skill not limited by armor? Who was he anyway? Kim still stood still as well, happy to have won. There were a total of three skills that Kim had acquired thanks to the Predator. First, Stone Skin. Second, Invisibility. Third, Paralysis. However, he didn't use all the skills from the beginning. C-rank Paralysis could not easily overcome S-rank Resistance. Invisibility was quickly destroyed by a wide range of fire attacks, and the Predator was a last resort. It was a kind of trump card up his sleeve that could not be used without thinking. Therefore, Kim's goal was to accumulate paralysis in his opponents in close combat. The downgrade skill had a great effect if it was reinforced by a direct hit rather than applied at a distance. In other words, if paralysis was applied several times with continuous strikes, even with the resistance of an S-rank opponent, it would sooner or later break through the defense. You just had to hit, hit, and hit again. And so, with a victorious gait, Kim walked towards his opponent, who was still unable to get up from the floor. There was a tense atmosphere in the air. Things were clearly not going as originally planned. It was something truly unbelievable. Kim had managed to defeat Li Zhongjie in a direct confrontation that was beyond any expectations. But this battle held one secret that was only moments away from being revealed. Lying on the floor, Li Zhongjie recognized the fact that he had lost in this fight. It seems that he had underestimated Kim too much for which he paid the price. But now he wasn't going to lose. Li Gyeongji took out a small purple crystal from his pocket and pressed his fingers to break it. What happened next was something that could not have been predicted. Li Gyeongji calmly got up from the floor and a huge fiery skeleton appeared above him. He had lost the first battle, but now he was going to become a worthy opponent. The huge skeleton instantly pounced on our protagonist. Realizing that his opponent had become stronger, Kim made the decision to retreat. The temperature in the hall was already not low, but with the appearance of the huge fiery skeleton, the degree of heat increased with every moment. Running away to a safe distance and jumping up, Kim built up a huge stone fist on his right hand, preparing to strike. A thin layer of blood was smeared on the right side of his face, and his gaze was filled with a fierce desire to get even with Li Zhongjie, who hated him so much. The skeleton opened its mouth full of sharp teeth and spat out a giant fireball. The stone armor and fire elemental clashed in a fierce confrontation. There was a monstrous heat around the stone skin, with temperatures reaching unimaginable levels. But the armor still held on. However, the fire elemental was stronger, the heat became even greater, and the stone skin cracked. There was an explosion, and the shockwave tossed our protagonist's body away. He fell to the ground, continuing to slide on the floor, while dozens, if not hundreds of stone shards of hot flames flew in his direction. The fiery skeleton was almost as tall as the hall where the fierce confrontation was taking place, and against its background, Kim looked like a small insect. Sol Hundo, who was watching the fight, knew that this skill represented the true form of Flaming Heart. In ordinary human form, it would be difficult to unleash the true power of the S-Class. But before summoning the magical essence, Li Junjie used a magic enhancement stone. This stone was also called Monster Heart, a product obtained by refining. Its specialty was that it temporarily enhanced magical power. After analyzing what he saw, Seol Hongdo realized that Li Zhongji was already capable of unleashing his S-rank power to its full potential. But there was one problem. Even though he was the bodyguard of a horrible man, there was still some humanity left in him. Screaming at the top of his voice, he asked Li Zhongji to stop. He didn't want to believe that Li Zhongji really wanted to kill his rival. Besides, this magic power was too strong for him. And just a little bit, all of his blood vessels would burst due to the leakage of magic energy. After saying that, a fiery projectile flew towards Sol Hundo. The shell exploded, throwing Seol Hundo aside. Shut up, you're just a bodyguard. How dare you give orders, said Li Zhongjie in an angry voice, making it clear that he wasn't going to listen to Seol Hundo's instructions. Kim had dared to defeat him and humiliate him, and the bodyguard still had the nerve to tell him to stop. Kim stood up after the hard fall and panted slightly, a thin layer of blood was already visible on each side of his face. When he raised his head, he felt fear. A cold chill ran through his body, and goosebumps ran down his back. Li Zhongji swung around and hit the protagonist with all his might, causing an explosion, 
whose shockwave damaged the floor around him. Li Zhongjie became completely unhinged, occasionally cursing or laughing hysterically at the protagonist. Seol Hongdo realized that his master had gone mad, and then he wondered, how can I stop him? He ran to the place where he had been struck. Trying to find out if Kim was alive, he shouted for him to stop fighting and run as fast as he could. Reaching out, he promised to stop the Lord somehow, but demanded that Kim get out of here as soon as possible. Seol Hundo's offer of help was answered by a punch in the face. He flew off to the side and scarlet liquid spurted from his mouth. In the smoke, Kim's silhouette appeared as he gradually climbed out of the pit. He wasn't going to run away like a coward, for it was Li Junjai who started the fight first, even though he recognized that the S rank was quite different. Rising from the pit, he drank the potion in a few moments, restoring fatigue, stamina, and mana. Since Li Junjai decided to show his true nature, our protagonist also decided to be himself. And while a fierce confrontation was unfolding in the main hall of the school, our story was briefly transported to the center of the Players' Association. The chairman of the Players' Association was sitting at a wooden table, and in front of him stood Guo Tai Wuk, who had recently visited the school where the battle was in full swing right now. Hearing what the two strongest students of the school had in common, the chairman was confused, asking, Is it really true? Although it was hard to believe, but yes. Li Zhongjie had a total score of 1900, and Lima Young had a total score of 2300. Each of them were confirmed S rank awakened ones. There were two women standing beside Guo Tewuk. One of them was confused by the overall performance of the disciples. The second woman was also troubled by it. This was already comparable to an A level player. Isn't this the level of a Japanese saint? The chairman of the association laughed quite a bit, saying that finally their new Korea had a saint level player. Saint, was one of the players representing Japan. She was 19 when she first tested her level and was a monster with a total score of over 2,500. Even that monster only had 2,500 points. Then what the heck was wrong with that guy's points? Guo Tewuk still couldn't find any peace from the moment he saw that mind-boggling figure. Even the Japanese saint who was clearly spoken of with great honor had half as many points. Could it be a simple illusion? Or maybe a mistake in skill? What is it? Guo Tewuk continued to wonder. He didn't report to his superiors about what had been troubling him all this time. After reporting on the two strongest students in the school, he left the office with the four men dressed in black suits. It was all too strange. And before reporting what he had seen to anyone, Guotawuk decided to find out in person. After that, the narration of the story continued in the main hall of the school. Sarl Hongdo couldn't believe his eyes. He could have imagined anything, but clearly not this. A giant fiery skeleton, was captured by the protagonist's red vines. Before this, the huge and seemingly invincible skeleton was clearly losing the battle. From time to time, the fire monster could be heard shrieking. The maddened Li Jongji couldn't understand why this was happening. He couldn't get his head around the fact that Kim, whom he thought was a weakling, had thrown him away like a rag doll. Him, the Tyson Group's heir and S rank holder, madness had finally clouded his mind, throwing away his common sense. In a desperate attempt to change his unfortunate situation, Li Zhongji tried to strike the protagonist, but this attempt failed. Kim didn't care what rank his opponent had or what corporation he was the heir to. None of this mattered, for Kim possessed the power of the king himself, a being whose might was beyond all possible expectations. At that moment, Li Zhongji realized that he had lost. Genuine horror appeared on his face. The proud and narcissistic Li Zhongji was defeated. In the blink of an eye, Everything shone with a bright yellow-red light. The atmosphere in the schoolyard and the neighborhood was calm. People's excited voices were heard. Cars were passing nearby. People generally went on with their lives, and there was no sign of trouble. But this calm atmosphere was destroyed by a powerful explosion from the main hall of the school. Part of the school's gymnasium had turned into ruins, with debris lying everywhere. After a long and grueling battle, Li Junjie collapsed, unable to get up. Sayol Hongdo who had been in the thick of things all this time, was trembling like an aspen leaf, and the blood in his veins was slowly turning cold. You surprised me, said Kim, looking at his opponent's bodyguard. Li Zhongjie was completely defenseless, and Seol Hongdo was performing his direct duties as a bodyguard. At the very last moment, he managed to grab and pull Li Zhongjie to a safe distance, which Kim was surprised by, but realized that he was an A-rang player. Well, it didn't matter since Kim had taken the skill anyway. And while Kim tasted the sweet taste of victory, Sol Hundo asked him a question in a trembling voice. What are you thinking about? 
My master is the heir to an influential corporation. How are you going to deal with the consequences? Seol Hongdo muttered. Kim thought for a few moments and then asked the bodyguard, Didn't he see who started the fight first? And anyway, did Kim look like the kind of person who would be frightened by something like that? In any case, even though Kim was furious with Lee jung Jae, he wasn't going to kill him. But in return, he was to receive payment for his life. The bodyguard was astonished at this news. His pupils dilated, his heart began to beat faster, and a chilling coldness ran through his entire body. Kim put his hand to his chin and began to consider his next decision. Considering that Lee jong Jae was the heir to the Tyson group after all, he pondered for a few seconds and then wondered, shouldn't I get one billion for him? Meanwhile, a crowd of students had already gathered near the school gymnasium and were looking in the direction of the burning building with great and genuine interest. They immediately began whispering among themselves, trying to figure out what had happened. Maybe it was a demon attack, maybe it was a monster attack, but none of their guesses were correct. Among the entire crowd of students, only Lim Ayung could feel the energy of magic and strong flames, which could certainly match Li Zhongjie's strength. But then who was his opponent? Images of Li Zhongjie waving a small fireball harmlessly, and Kim trying to call for help in terror, came to mind. This was how she imagined the relationship between them. The school nurse tried her best to calm the students down and told them not to get too close to the burning building. Only while she was saying all this, she lost sight of Lim Young running away. When she turned around, it was too late. Lim Young had already run a good distance away and was clearly not coming back. Even though she saw a huge amount of fire around the building, it was strange. So she decided to check the gym to make sure. Running into the room at full speed, she began to blame herself for what had happened. As the guilt grew, she prayed to all the gods she knew that Kim was still alive. But breaking through the many layers of fire and smoke, the first thing she saw was the unconscious body of Lee jong Jae. Standing nearby was a nearly unharmed Kim. The scene looked strange. There was fire, smoke, and debris everywhere. And in the midst of all this chaos was the unconscious body of one of the strongest students in the school. Lima Young was confused to see something like that and Kim told her in a calm voice that she was just in time. He just needed someone to move Lee jong to the nurse's station, or better yet, straight to the hospital. Lim Young ran up to Lee jong and started questioning the protagonist about what happened here. He told her that he didn't know what Lee jong was doing, but he was lying here alone. Maybe he fell down the stairs or something. Fell down the stairs. Lim Young somehow had little faith in such a theory, considering the injuries Lee jong had received. As Kim further said, he still doesn't know what happened. He asked Lim Young not to tell anyone that she saw him here. Kim turned around and said he was out of here. Lim Young was still confused and demanded that Kim explain everything properly. However, when she turned around, she didn't see anyone. Like a ghost that suddenly disappeared, Kim vanished without a trace, making Lim Young have a strange feeling. While a thick column of smoke was billowing from the school gymnasium, Kim quietly made his way to the other side of the city, aided by his invisibility skill. Lim Young will take care of Lee jong Jae somehow. The Taesun group should also not pester him. All in all, this day was ending quite well for him. After all this commotion, he had completely forgotten about his status window, so he decided to check it. Everything looked the same as usual, the base stats had increased, but there were two surprises amongst the list of stats and abilities. The first surprise was a certain charm that appeared next to such characteristics as speed, stamina, mana, and so on. The second surprise was the Heart of the Monarch, a skill that increased the abilities of the group members. Charm kind of only referred to appearance like numerous celebrities, but how something like that got here when it absorbed Lee jong power. In addition, the skill obtained wasn't called Flaming Heart, but Monarch's Heart. Did a jerk like Lee jong really have such a skill? But it's even a good thing. Skills that affected the entire group were rare regardless of their level. Since he had several skills, he could combine them, but the heart of a monarch was much better. The peculiar hunt ended well enough. The day was nearing its end, and it seemed like all the unpleasant moments were over. But suddenly, three black-colored cars appeared behind the protagonist's back. He was dumbfounded. Finally found you, student Kim, said a man as he got out of one of the black cars. This man turned out to be Go Tai Wook, and he had several questions for the protagonist, and there were at least six men nearby, looking very serious. The dumbfounded Kim still had no way of understanding why this man was here. Go Tae Wook stood for a few seconds and asked Kim with sternness in his voice, What did you do in the gym? And while an unexpected conversation ensued between Go Tae Wook and Kim, 
The narrative of our story is briefly transported to a huge manor house. So this is the bottom line? said the man in a commanding voice, holding glasses of liquor with a few ice cubes in his hand. My only son is in the hospital, but as if that wasn't enough, I paid for his life, the man continued to say while the barking of aggressive dogs could be heard nearby. The compensation amounted to one billion. Can you deal with this problem as quietly as possible? It was a very powerful man. He was sitting in an expensive armchair, three purebred dogs were sitting beside him, and moonlight was beaming through the huge window. The man's voice alone made Seol Hundo tremble in terror. With a trembling voice, Seol Hundo tried to apologize to this man. But the man said, let Seol Hundo do as he pleased, to which the bodyguards were very surprised. But that was not all. No matter how much is paid, we must also be compensated, said the man. Mr. Director, what did you mean by that? His opponent was a very young boy. That's ruthless, exclaimed Seol Hundo trying to express his disagreement with the man. With just a few words, he made the bodyguard shut up, signaling him to talk less. His name was Lee Chong Su, an S-ranked player and also the CEO of Taysen Group. His cold gaze full of determination said that he was willing to go to any lengths to avenge his son. The narration of the story then returned to the protagonist. He didn't understand how Go Tae Wook could be here. And what exactly did he want to know? Was he talking about the explosion or the incident at the lecture? Kim continued to wonder still unable to find any peace. Since Go Tai Wook was the deputy director of the association, the chances of him personally visiting, instead of the fire, were slim. But what if he already knew that Kim was the culprit and made his move? All that was left was to figure out the answers to the questions that emerged. Not long after his silence, Kim broke it by asking Go Tae Wook if he had talked about the explosion in the gymnasium. Explosion? Go Tae Wook asked. Looking at the main character somewhat surprised, it was obvious from his surprised reaction that that was clearly not what he was asking. Turning his head slightly in the left direction, Gotowook saw smoke and realized that Kim was telling him about the fire that way. At least it wasn't their concern. It was still a problem for other organizations to deal with. But Gotowook still hadn't heard an answer to his question about what Kim was doing in the gym. Kim wondered if Gotowook didn't know about the explosion. He thought about the above for a few seconds and then smiled. You're not aware of it yet? The protagonist asked Go Tae Wook. Kim was sure his visit had something to do with the fact that they wanted to invite him for a player's test. A test of the player? On what basis did the protagonist even have the right to think about it? But Kim had a good, even a very good reason for such an assumption. He showed off his total in all its glory, which already equaled 5214. Wasn't that still not enough? Everyone present stood dumbfounded and frozen in mute shock. What they had seen could not fit into any of their heads. It was so hard to believe something like this. But Go Tae Wook had the hardest time accepting this fact. He couldn't believe that the kid had gotten even stronger in just a few hours. So this figure was neither a coincidence nor a mistake. Who the hell is Kim? Is the question that popped into the minds of everyone in attendance. And while everyone did nothing but wonder, Kim smiled contentedly, wondering what would happen next. But instead of ordering his subordinates to attack Kim for fear of the unknown or running away in a hurry, Go Tae Wook took in a chest full of air and exhaled, asking Kim why his clothes were so dirty. He didn't know what to say to that. Some time passes, and the narration of the story continues in the protagonist's house. Huang Jae Yun was dumbfounded by the news that his cousin was going to the player's exam in a month. While he reacted to it with all sorts of emotions, Kim was tuned into it like a soulless machine that just accepted the fact and prepared for what was to come. The expression on Huang Jae Yong's face expressed surprise, huge and unending. He even began to worship his cousin, calling him king, god, general, emperor, and his majesty. But Kim, thinking that his cousin was joking, did not appreciate the joke. As for the gym, the Tisan group was supposed to take care of everything, and Go Tae Wook's suspicions would likely be dispelled. The exam was a month away so Kim could focus on training for now. Therefore, there shouldn't have been any more problems. In peaceful silence, he planned to continue practicing in preparation for the exam, but that silence was broken by the phone ringing. The phone continued to vibrate as the protagonist's hand slowly reached out to pick it up. Two men dressed in black and white suits were intently watching Kim's house sitting on the roof of a neighboring building. The one in the white suit clutched the neck of the association member tightly wondering why they were guarding some high schooler's house. It pissed him off, 
and he continued to squeeze the man's neck with pleasure, bringing him to a critical state. The one in the black suit thought for a few seconds and assumed that this kid was probably one of the ones participating in the upcoming player test. That's usually how the association took care of rising stars. These killers were called Black and White Brother. The one in black was the Elder Brother, an A-Rang Demon with stealth and body enhancement skills. The younger brother, a B-Rang Demon with stealth skill, didn't believe his brother's words. How can some kid with little experience be a rising star? The older brother agreed with the younger brother's reasoning, even if the player was a prospect. Without enough experience, he was nothing. The two of them were going to show everyone what a true awakened was. However, turning around, the older brother caught an unexpected sight. Someone had grabbed his brother, holding him by the neck with one hand and delivering a series of blows with the other. The older brother was outraged at this insolence and took out a hidden blade glittering in the moonlight, preparing to stab the one who dared to raise his hand against his younger brother. Noticing his older brother approaching, the man who had dealt with the white brother in moments left him behind, shifting his attention to a new target. The older brother's gaze was determined to take revenge on the offender who thought he was special and had harmed his brother, but it all disappeared in an instant. The man who dealt with the white brother in less than a minute was our protagonist. Having waited for the right moment, he jumped up and having grown a stone skin on his knee, struck his elder brother in the face with a twisting blow. Tiny stone shards flew in all directions, but there was even more blood. In flight, Kim pressed his knee on his older brother's face even harder. Blood flowed from his nose and mouth again, and the enemy tasted new pain. The situation was truly comedic. The kid, who they didn't perceive as a real threat because of his alleged lack of experience, had them dead to rights within a couple of minutes. But to understand the details of what happened, you have to travel back a few hours to the time when the school gym was still burning. This was the moment when Kim talked about the billion-dollar deal. Though Go Tae Wook was surprised, but even if he kept silent about the incident, it wasn't up to him alone. Who doesn't know that? muttered our protagonist. Kim said he wasn't such a bad man that he would hold his subordinates accountable. He demanded that Go Tae Wook just do his best to reach an agreement. And in case you betray me, can you draw a conclusion? Kim asked his enemy's bodyguard. Each of them was bound to each other by the oath of the Awakened One. It was a way to enter into a contract created by the Awakened using magical power. If broken, a perpetual random fine was imposed. The conditions were simple. One, along with the requested compensation of one billion, one had to do one's best to cover up the incident in the gym. The first point was fulfilled. A TV anchor reported on the breaking news that the fire in the gymnasium of Taysen High School was caused by a gas explosion, and as she went on to say, fortunately, there were no casualties. The second condition stated the following. Be informed in advance of any retaliation. Hiding in the middle of a huge number of trees whose branches were covered with a thick layer of green foliage, Guo Tawuk called our protagonist. By the oath of the awakened man, he was obliged to give him information about the assassins. Determined to finish the job to the end, the elder brother aimed the second blade at Kim. But his movements were primitive. Thanks to the information he had received, Kim had no trouble dodging the numerous series of attacks. All he had to do was to dodge in time and anticipate the next moves. Then, finding a gap in the defense, Kim clenched his fist and swung at the black brother with all his might. But then, he was as nimble as a ninja who was behind Kim's back in a flash, ready to thrust both blades in. He flew at Kim with all his speed, eager to finish him off as quickly as possible. But this attempt failed. Kim knew that the brother's specialty was stealth attacks and the use of invisibility, but as expected, they were nothing outstanding, at least to Kim. In the end, apparently that was all they were capable of. Their attempts to harm Kim in any way were only a temporary and minor inconvenience to him. Meanwhile, one premium car painted black was driving along the three-lane road, in the company of a bus and unremarkable cars. In the passenger seat was Yu Eng, the head of the Night Vagabonds Guild. Speaking to someone on a wireless earpiece, she asked, Is the selection of participants for the player's exam really over? This exam was supposed to gather promising candidates from all over the country. Who are you waiting for, Chairman? Shirley Shin Yunbak from Busan, S rank. Yu An asked the man on the other end of the connection. Ji Jin, we of course realized that this candidate was great, but he was waiting for someone else more than anything else. He was most looking forward to Yu An's younger brother. Hey, what junior? Is there anything he can accomplish in this family? Yu An replied somehow skeptically, 
and Ji Jinhui on the other end of the connection mouthed that she was still as picky as ever. But he wondered who she was looking forward to? That kid named Shin Yunbok? Yuang thought for a few seconds and told her interlocutor that he hadn't heard something interesting yet. After saying that, the man frowned his thick black eyebrows. His gaze became more piercing and his voice lower. He asked his interlocutor what she was talking about. While admiring the views of the Night City, Yu Eng said that in addition to other S ranks, she heard that there was a guy that the deputy director, Guo Tai Wuk, had personally come to see. They were curious as to who this young man was that Guo Tai Wuk had decided to personally visit. They hoped he had checked and verified everything. Meanwhile, while the two men were having a fascinating conversation, Kim had already dealt with the assassins who were annoying him. Everything seemed fine, but it wasn't. When the two men were unable to attack, Kim decided to use the predator but his lack of physical ability prevented him from doing so. Due to the overload, using the Predator was impossible. After the brief battle, a calm atmosphere prevailed on the street. Most people didn't even realize what had happened. They were either already asleep or preparing to sleep. The neutralized brothers were unconscious, their hands tied, and several representatives of the Players Association were already standing nearby. This attack alarmed them. It wasn't enough that these brothers were already annoying the members of the association, but they had decided to ruin the lives of the high school students. The guy on the right asked his colleague if he thought that these demons were only getting nastier. Gota Wook thanked the protagonist for informing him. He then asked if there was any idea who was behind this attack. Kim raised his eyebrows slightly and began to think about the answer. Alas, he had no assumptions about that. Gota Wook thought, could it be that the list of participants had been revealed? He decided that he would have to ask for reinforcements. Meanwhile, Kim thought that if he blamed Tyson Group for the situation, he would have gotten into a lot of trouble instead of hiding it. However, the immediate priority was not the corporation, but a bigger problem, the lack of physical capabilities and the overload that made it impossible to use the Predator. That was what he was concerned about, not the assassins, not those who might be behind them. Those were all just minor things, due to the lack of physical capabilities, he couldn't even use not only the Predator, but also the other skills. What were they for then? But giving up was not an option, and it was necessary to solve the problem somehow. The first option that appeared in Kim's mind was to increase the level of awakening by using the Predator on monsters. But this idea would fail, because the Predator itself was needed. The same idea arose with Awakened. But this option was also doomed to failure without the main skill. The situation actually drove the protagonist into a dead end. Fortunately, Kim was not a timid 10, and the situation was not so unsolvable. There was only one option that Kim didn't want to use, but since there were no other methods, there was only this one. With these thoughts, he went to bed and woke up the next morning when most people were rushing to work. Kim headed to one place, the Blackhead Training Center. He was greeted at the entrance by a charming girl with a luxurious strand of hair, who was barely over 20 years old. The girl greeted the new visitors by introducing herself as the guide of the training center. And of course, as was customary when meeting new visitors, she excitedly asked how she could help them. Kim also brought along Huang Jiayong, who didn't understand why his cousin wanted to go to the Blackhead, where you had to have money, strength, and everything to register. Seeing two high school students standing in front of her, the girl said that this was a serious place. But Kim interrupted her with a deft hand motion holding out a card and asking her to register two people. It was a black card with gold inlays that shimmered brightly in the daylight. He asked her if it was enough to register. The girl looked with genuine interest at the alchemist's SVIP card that Kim had gotten earlier when he signed a contract with one of the four major guilds. But where did he get it from? Is he related to a high-ranking player or the son of a powerful man? The girl became nervous. Droplets of sweat ran down her face because if she just spent the payment and some mistake happened, she might be in trouble. The silence in the guild card she was holding in her hands kept her calm. Suddenly, a muscular man appeared at the far end of the hall, noticing the girl's dilemma. As he said, this wasn't a place you could enter just by paying money. They called him the strongest Kenchal here. He was a B-rank trainer and a beginner's killer. Of the skills was muscle strengthening. The specialty was that he developed himself. The strongest Kenchal was assuming all sorts of poses, showing off his superior musculature in every way possible. While the girl and Huang Jiayun were enthralled by such a performance, Kim stood with an unperturbed stone face. The Rocking Brothers watched as Mr. Kanchol continued to show off his muscles. 
They felt somewhat sorry for the kids that Mr. Kunjol was morally destroying. See how everyone trembles when they hear my name? said Kanchol without stopping to show off his muscles. Kim looked at the whole spectacle and said, What are you yapping about, you weak brat? Kangchol frowned his eyebrows. His gaze became as sharp as a majestic eagle, and the intonation of his voice lowered. He looked very displeased after what Kim had dared to say to him. The girl and Kim's cousin, who were watching all this, began to feel nervous. A slight chill descended down their backs. Kangchol immediately objected, saying how dare Kim say that he was stronger than him. Kim was not going to retract his words, and since Kangchol didn't believe him, he proposed a bet. The loser was to pay the membership fee for one year. Kangchol, intent on defending his honor and his name, agreed to argue with the protagonist. To decide who was right and who was wrong, it was decided to have a contest. Kim and Kangchul found themselves in virtual reality, and the crowd cheered as they anticipated the great battle to come. Fuang Jiayan stared at the screen above his opponent's heads for a few seconds and was horrified, as those places looked distinctly like the abyss. The girl standing next to him explained that it was a virtual training program, a virtual porter. It was obvious from Cousin Kim's confused reaction that this was the first time he had heard something like this. Virtual porter. It is a competitive workout in which participants must carry the maximum weight. The main objective was to defeat the maximum number of B-class monsters and reach the destination in the shortest time possible in a virtual reality completely identical to the abyss. When it came to a fight for supremacy in the training center, virtual competition was the most common way to settle such a dispute. But the girl was somewhat puzzled. It was too disadvantageous to the opponent of the strongest Kang Chul. Determined and eager to defend his honor, Kang Chul intended to triumph in the shortest possible time. The monster swooped down upon him and immediately met his powerful fists. Thanks to his muscle augmentation skill, he crushed monsters left and right as if they were pathetic bugs to him. For such a bulky man, the maneuverability and agility skill was perfect in this competition. Kong Chul fought his way through the monsters, knocking out one combo after another. What gave him confidence was that the weight he could lift was on a whole other level. All of these factors added up to the idea in his mind that he would wipe out any boy who dared to question his strength. But that sweet sense of superiority dissipated like smoke colliding with a mighty current of wind. Kim ran past Kang Chul, killing all the monsters and turning them into broken pixels. He moved like a ninja, fast, fearless, elusive. As he neared the end of his ordeal, he encountered new hordes of merciless creatures along the way. These monsters were but a passing trial. He pushed through with the power of a bulldozer and the speed of a cheetah. Kim never thought of stopping for a moment, his determination driving him forward. Nothing could stop the beast who wanted to reach the end of the challenge. The monsters that appeared, hoping to stop Kim, were immediately defeated, just like the other creatures before them. The end was just around the corner, and our protagonist was anticipating how he would reach the end. No wave of monsters could stop him. Every attempt was futile. All of this happened in less than a minute. Kang Chul, who was watching, caught a giant explosion. Kim knocking out the maximum combo. Kang Chul couldn't believe his eyes. The boy he thought was a cocky upstart had defeated him in no time. The crowd also couldn't believe what had happened. The newcomer who had suddenly appeared had also suddenly won. But Huang Jae Yong, who knew what his cousin was capable of, didn't doubt Kim's victory for a second. The strongest Kang Chul turned out to be not so strong. All his determination was no longer of any use. He lost. Kim told the loser to pay up and get lost. After that, the narrative of the story continues into the future. Thirty days had passed since Kim's victory in the virtual abyss, and the long-awaited day that the whole country had been waiting for had finally arrived. The player's license test was officially opened. It was an event of enormous proportions. Candidates gathered in one place, waiting for further developments. Reporters flying by helicopter captured everything from a bird's-eye view. Since minors were also invited to participate this time by recommendation, people of various ages from all over the country flocked to the association's testing center. The most anticipated players among the countless candidates were the unrivaled in close combat, the strong fist, Hong Jong Nook, A rank, possessing superior combat sense that even S ranks couldn't beat, Druid, Lee Gilson, A rank, unrivaled in Busan, Thunderer, Shin Yongbok, S rank the one who was rumored to be the owner of the highest score among the surrenders. Rising star of the saint level, Lima Young, S rank. A large number of talented people were planning to participate in this exam. Meanwhile, 
While everyone was engrossed in the upcoming player's license test, one girl had a monstrous anxiety. It was Psy Economics' new reporter. She was worried that, if she didn't report again, she would be dishonorably discharged. Among her skills was typing, and the goal was to interview and film with the exam participants. And speaking of interviewing the participants, she couldn't even take photos. No one cared about any reporter there. Despair fully descended on her shoulders. She imagined her life gradually falling apart. After all, what could her E-rank? And while she was falling into despair, someone's footsteps were heard behind her back. Turning around with tears in her eyes, she saw a person unhappy that there were so many people here. How will the participants be able to pass then? Realizing that it was a participant, hope shone in her eyes. The one who appeared behind her was our protagonist. Ignoring the reporter, he continued walking forward. Unlike most people who were breathtakingly excited by this event, he was bored to death. But there was nothing to do, and he kept walking. He was distracted from these musings by a reporter who asked in a slightly stuttering voice if he could be interviewed. Some time passed, and the gathered crowd around the building only grew larger. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of people everywhere who were excited about the upcoming event. The protagonist was approaching the entrance, and the woman standing in the aisle told him to hurry up, for the exam was only a minute away. He breathed a sigh of relief, for he was almost late because of the sudden interview. The person who took up his time with her interview was the reporter. Well, it didn't bother him at all. On the contrary, it was even good, for he decided to take care of his image in advance. After passing through a small corridor, Kim found himself in a spacious white room where hundreds of participants, like himself, were standing. These were people from completely different parts of the country, with their own skills ideals, and even fears. But all of them were united by the desire to become players. Before the exam began, Kim decided to walk along the room, occasionally glancing at the snow-white walls dotted with square patterns. Some of the participants of the forthcoming exam were already feeling a slight shiver. They could be understood. After all, the moral load was not small. Suddenly, a very familiar voice was heard among the many conversations. Kim immediately recognized the girl who addressed him. As he turned around, his eyes met with Lim Ayung, who was not expecting to meet him. Although their meeting was unexpected, it was expected that one of the strongest students in the school would come to the player's exam. Lim Ayun's face was frozen with unimaginable surprise. She asked Kim what happened to his body. Kim said he was just practicing a little. That's what he called a little training? To Lim Ayung, it was like he was a completely different person. Besides, she heard that Kim had awakened, but how could so many changes happen in a month? She hadn't gotten any answers to her questions since their last meeting, so she decided to talk about the incident at the gym. Their conversation was interrupted by the sudden appearance of a man on multiple screens who greeted all the youth that would carry the future of the new Korea. The room in which everyone was gathered was the first round of the test, where future players were to be chosen among the awakened. After the man began to explain the rules of the first round, asking all the participants to look at their chests. There was an exam badge there with each participant's number engraved on it. In this exam, you had to collect five badges, including your own. That is, if a participant did not have his own badge, he would be eliminated. This was the so-called struggle for the exam badge. The trial was limited to one hour. After the man finished with his explanation, the floor beneath the participants began to change. Some cubes moved sideways, some fell down. Some of the participants managed to resist this suddenness, but some were already falling down. Everything except killing was allowed, and with such a sudden event, a man marked the beginning of the first round of the examination. These cubes acted like some sort of gravitational device. Every facet of one or another cube had a gravitational function, for some participants stood vertically, others horizontally, and some even upside down. If you haven't figured it out by now, the test was to take the exam badge away from another contestant, and at least five people chose Lim Ah Young as their first target. Each of them was hoping to get their hands on the badge they so desired. Lim Ah Young was not going to stand idly by. Either she would take someone else's badge, or someone else would take her badge. With a light and smooth movement, she summoned a giant cluster of ice crystals, which in the blink of an eye swept away all the enemies. The people in the special room were watching everything that was happening. They were watching Lim Ah Young's results with great admiration. Truly a true future star. The other test takers didn't stand out. Among the entire crowd of participants, the man in the black jacket had expectations about one candidate he was sure of. Shin Yoon Bok, S rank from Busan. 
this was who he was expecting in the winner's league. It had been 20 minutes since the start of the test. Without talking about every effective strike, no one could get close to him. All the people agreed that Shin Yunbok's abilities were truly amazing. They began to discuss excitedly about who would prove to be better, Lim Ayung or Shin Yunbok. While they were still debating, Go Taewook, who was standing far away from them, was thinking about something else. Considering what scores those two contestants had, their interest was understandable. But Guo Taewook saw a much more interesting figure. He decided not to tell anyone about Kim yet. Go Taewook was betting big on him. For considering all the events that had happened to this young man, one thing could be said. His strength was immense, and this exam was the perfect time to show it off in all its glory. He had already begun to watch the protagonist fight one of the contestants. But then he noticed something that made him recoil from the screen, almost falling off the floor. What he saw was not what he had expected to see. The protagonist's opponent was an awakened A rank, Hong Jong Nook, who used the iron skin skill in the fight. He had the armor skill, that's why Kim also decided to use his armor, but stone armor. Meanwhile, Go To Wook was confused. Had he misunderstood Kim's skills? He couldn't believe that he had been seen off by an awakened A class man. He didn't even dodge a single punch. Wait a minute, didn't dodge a single punch? That's kind of weird. At the same time, the fight between the guys was in full swing. Each of them ran at their opponent with all their speed. Kim came close to Hong Jung Kook, who, noticing a gap in the enemy's defense, had already put his fist in his face. Hong Jun Kook swung and struck with all his might, and numerous bloody drops flew in all directions. Did Kim dare to challenge him? Stone skin was a perfectly backwards compatible skill with iron skin. It wasn't enough to fight Hong Junuk head on, and he intentionally threw punches that were meant to miss. Kim was a little tired that there was so much chatter just because of one person. Anyway, this doesn't make sense, Kim muttered as he wiped the blood from his face. His charisma and stamina, meanwhile, had been increased by one. Even after a month of training, the seal on the predator was not broken. This meant that Kim's abilities were still insufficient. The way to increase performance through training was to provide as much stimulation as the body could handle. It meant that training was ultimately about fighting at the limit of one's abilities. Because of this, his training was still not over. The guys clashed fists again, each hitting their opponent's face. But the surprise was that Hong Junuk's metal armor around his head and neck disappeared almost completely. Though the blow was hard, Kim felt more than awake and healthy, ready to continue fighting. His opponent at the same time felt decidedly less well. The metal armor was covered in cracks, continuing to crumble in small pieces. A few moments later, Hong Junuk collapsed to the floor, defeated. Kim walked over to the body of his fallen enemy and took his badge from him. And including his own, he owned two badges. Seeing how this battle eventually unfolded, Go Taiwook, who was watching, laughed quite a bit. Of course he could expect a lot of things, but what Kim had done was something crazy. Go Daewook couldn't stop laughing, which was noticed by the people standing nearby. One of them suggested that he was waiting for the rising stars. However, all his thoughts were occupied with the protagonist. This method of training in a large-scale battle for survival was daring but frightening, except that there was a problem because of this. The training was focused on characteristics, but in this battle, he had used up too much stamina. Deciding that Kim would conserve stamina, Go Wook thought that Kim wouldn't risk it and would collect the badges of the weak. However, the protagonist's next decision shocked Go Wook. The people standing nearby immediately started talking about some awakened C rank. Seeing him approaching the strong opponent people were wondering what that person was going to do next. That person was our protagonist. That's who those people were talking about so passionately. Not far away was Shin Yunbok, one of the strongest in this trial, as evidenced by the huge number of bodies around him. There were at least 14 badges on his clothes, but he actually possessed 147 badges. Looking up and noticing a figure nearby, Shin Yunbok thought, Who's the one who showed up here? One, two, three, four. Kim began to leisurely count the badges on the guy's body. Damn, one thing was clear. Shin Yunbok was carrying a lot more than five badges.